So yesterday we were talking about uh, the replication controller, right? Uh, okay. So we were talking about uh, the replication controller. We will not use a pod YAML file to deploy an application because a lot of disadvantages are there. As we discussed, uh, if we are using the replication controller, then we can achieve the high availability, right? So let me log into the master machine. Okay, so yesterday we deployed some applications to CTL. So we just now uh, power down our machines. So whatever the replication controller we created, we can see that replication controller also with the help of kubectl get RC. So here we can see what name we have given to the replication controller and uh, this is uh, the values we can see desired current ready okay so again if you check now if you see these are in the running state because we powered on the machines so once the worker nodes are available then automatically this uh, pods came online so the major advantage of this replication controller is high availability so we have only two worker nodes so that's the reason two pods has been created on one worker node and the third one is created on another work node. So now what you can do, you can scale up and scale down also. So how we can do that? So you can execute kubectl, scale, uh, rc, you can give in a short form rc, uh, the name of that uh, replication controller. So this is the name of the replication controller, nginx, and hyphen hyphen replicas equal to let's say if I give phi. So this is a command we can use and it's been scaled up. And uh, if you check, now you can see phi now, okay. And uh, even if you can see, now total five pods has been created. So these are the two pods which are created recently. So total it became five and if you want to scale down then you can use the same command if you want only two then you can use two again it's scaled down and uh, you can check the pods are getting terminated and only two will be available okay so when we executed the command called a kubectl create hyphen f the yaml file name so it's created this replication controller so this replication controller also you can modify see on fly i have given the command to uh, scale up and scale down another way is to do is modify this replication controller so to modify this replication controller, kubectl, edit, rc, nginx, okay. So it will open in, in a YAML file format, okay. So now this is a configuration. And uh, here if you see replicas equal to two. So that replication controller has been modified with the command which I executed, the scale down which I have done. So here also you can come down and you can give, let's say four. Now it is showing as a four. So changes has been applied. So what are the changes we have done to that configuration? 
so it has been updated and uh, we can see the pods also four pods will be created so this is a purpose of replication controller okay and how come replication controller knows that it should increase these pods or decrease whatever we are doing the changes replication controller how it is getting identified that it need to be increased or decreased specific pods see replication control is separate it got created this is a replication controller so pods are separate how come this replication controller knows it should increase only these pods and decrease these pods with the help of labels we call it as in selectors so if you observe i'll open a Uh, Praveen, can you please uh, tell the command again for creating the this thing replication control? Creating. Yeah. Any object, if you are creating the same command, we will use create kubectl create hyphen f and the YAML file name. What are the YAML file we are using? So for this, I was using or uh, see, this is the YAML file I was using. So inside that, whatever the specifications you give, what objects you define to create, those things will be created. So this file contains, I will open this file in the uh, Kubernetes page. Okay, replication controller Kubernetes. Okay, if you see the same file, so whatever I copied it from here, and uh, I, guys, can you please go on mute? Okay, so the same file it is. If you see this RC, this is the same file. I copied it from here. You guys also can copy it from here so you just search replication controller kubernetes then you will get the main page so there you will can able to get this file okay so if you see here in the spec field you can see selector app okay and a template this name is also showing the same name so with the help of these labels replication controller you are telling replication controller that okay so these are the applications are getting deployed. This is the app name. This is the label name. So with the help of this selector, replication controller knows that okay, these are the pods. It needs to be increased or decreased, whatever the activity we are doing. Okay. So if you don't mention this selector, then replication controller will not able to scale up or scale down okay because it don't know which application it should it's need to be scaled up and scaled down so that's why for replication controller we can see this as a selector and app equal to nginx and here the same again you are giving the name nginx and labels equal to app for the container so that's why it can able to recognize okay replication controller knows that these are the applications with the label names so why we use labels so here whenever we are creating any deployments we will give labels why because to identify easily hundreds of pods will be there now if i type kubectl get pods it will show hundreds of pods from that you want to see the information about only some application pods for example one application is having eight pods you want to display only those eight pods you want to see the information then for all those eight applications we can give label of that application name so that we can see kubectl get pods iphone l label equal to whatever the label name was assigned to that one then we can able to see only those pods so that's the reason we give labels and selector means what this label is using by some other entity to select okay you are giving a matching that this label name like how we are giving here in the replication controller identifying uh, 
specific applications with this label name so that we are selecting so that is called as an selector here okay but this replication controller if you observe api version is showing v1 v1 means as i said yesterday those are old objects means very initial stage they might be created but now the alternate has been introduced by the kubernetes for this replication controller that is called as an replica set okay so what is this replica set on almost same but only thing is the difference between a replica set and a, a replication controller is majorly into this selector field okay this is about replication controller this is old uh, deployment type now replica set So how replica set works replica set is defined with fields including a selector that specifies how to identify pods It can acquire a number of replicas indicating how many pods it should be maintaining and a pod template specifying the data of new pods So here major is selector So the remaining everything is same. Okay, but only thing is the difference between the replication controller and replica set is this selectors so it will be like uh, so here quality based selectors and a replica set or set based selectors so this is the difference between these two okay so what is this quality based selectors quality based selectors like equal to double equal to and uh, not equal to means this will give uh, in the selector tabs okay and uh, set based selectors are Mm, in not in and exists okay so here how we are going to define this the major uh, disadvantage here is we use selectors to match labels right so here only we can give one key key one only one value let's say um for example environment equal to let's say we can give production or maybe development and uh, this way what it will do in the key value pair it will just only filter the labels equal to environment equal to production only one value you can give and uh, let's say tire if you give this one uh, front end means this is not equal to means whatever the tire you have front end back end or apart from any other tires among all them you don't want to display only front end okay so not equal to means what if you are giving front end means apart from front end uh, tire all the remaining labels whatever is there in the tire field it should be displayed maybe back end is there some other applications are there in the tire field so all will be displayed if you give equal to means what if you don't give this one it's equal to means it will display only front end pods okay you labeled it as a front end and that front end uh, pods only will be displayed but if you give not equal to means it is not going to display front end pods and it is going to display all the remaining pods so only this way you can give but whereas in a replica set so what it is going to do so here 
you can give in uh, environment in and here you can give multiple values also so it will display production and it will display qa and if you give another dev also it is going to give okay and uh, not in tire not in means you don't want to display then uh, front end back end like this you can give multiple values so if you want more about this you can search with quality uh, based uh, selectors Uh, if you can please uh, zoom in a bit So is it not visible still you want to uh, make it more zoom so when you use a notepad file then okay Okay, so you can get more information about this uh, quality based selectors and uh, set based selectors when you are using replication controller. Okay. So, but still we don't use replica set or replication controller to deploy our applications in the real time environment whether it's maybe production or non production environment we don't use uh, replica sets okay so which one we'll use i'll discuss later before that i would like to discuss about the another type of deployment called a uh, stateful set okay so we have discussed application control and replica set now we'll discuss about stateful set so what is the stateful set some kind of applications will expect stateful set okay so what those kind of applications will see stateful set so here so these are all the deployment types how we are deploying the applications on the kubernetes cluster these are different ways so this is one of the way to deploy stateful set is a workload api object used to manage stateful applications so manages the deployment and scaling of the set of pods and provides guarantees about the ordering and uniqueness of this pod so like a deployment stateful set manages pods that are based on identical container spec unlike a deployment it will maintain sticky identity for each of their pods so these pods are created from the same spec not interchangeable each has a persistent identified that it maintains across any rescheduling so here when we use this stateful set because first of all the docker or this kubernetes we are using mostly these are for the stateless applications okay so what is stateless and stateful Can anyone tell me what is the difference between stateful and stateless? Volumes are saved, volumes are not saved. So stateless means the application is not going to store any data. Okay, even if the container or even if the pod dies, we are not bothered about the data. Okay, it means we don't want the data. Those are called as a stateless applications. If you are bothered about the data you want to store the data then those are called as stateful applications means we are expecting the data because again if a new pod is getting created 
it should use the old data which was created by the old part so means there should be a volume concept should be there so volume contains the data the new part gets created and that new part should use that volume so that it can access the data so these are called as a stateful applications which is going to store the data the applications which doesn't require data those are like a stateless so basically maximum applications will use the um stateless applications only but sometimes like for example database you are deploying okay and uh, for example uh, uh, for log aggregation we are installing elastic search kibana okay so it collects all the log information data right so we need the data if the pods gets deleted then the logs data will also get deleted so if i want to search last one week logs then it will be not available so it need to store the data so then it should maintain a volume so some applications are required to store the data for those applications we allocate a volume okay so those are called as a stateful applications and here when we use this uh, stateful set so another uh, difference between this replication controller or replica set and this stateful set so when i mention three replicas stateful set will not go and deploy parallelly at a time okay so first it will create one pod and once it is up and running then only it will go and create second pod and uh, once second pod is ready then only it will go and create the third pod okay so that way it is going to create and when deleting also what it will do it will delete the third pod first and once it is deleted then only it will delete the second pod and uh, then it will delete the first pod why uh, when this concept is useful because see whenever let's say they we are going to maintain uh, for example in the database if you take um, for sometimes you want the pods like a active passive kind of scenario okay so you want to run an active passive i hope you guys are aware about active passive active passive means active will receive the traffic passive will not receive the traffic when active goes down passive will become as an active again when active recovers then again passive uh, which was the passive was become active that will become as a passive this was using in the uh, traditional data centers like per clusters or any virtual machines application high availability okay so that concept you want to achieve here when you are creating three pods in three replicas okay as a replication controller or replica set the traffic will come to all the three at a time there is no passive active it will receive traffic but here only one will be active and another will be passive okay so in this scenario when you are creating when the deployment has been done with this uh, replica set then parallelly it will create at a time both will get created and both one will become active so you want to write a mechanism which that it will do kind of election or like uh, it will tell that okay this will will become master and this one will become slave or this one will become active and this will become passive to achieve this it should create one by one not parallel at a time okay so then in that scenario if any applications are expecting uh, to maintain this then those kind of applications are going to be used stateful set as a deployment type so that one win will become a master or active and second one will become either slave or maybe passive okay the example is uh, rabbit mq and uh, rabbit mq is a messaging queue rabbit mq and uh, another example is elastic search so these two deployment types we use uh, stateful sets okay rabbit mq
the templates you see your stateful set this is a yaml file actually this is in the helm chart so that's why it is taking from the values.yaml file when we talk about the helm chart at the time i'll explain you mm. okay only you can see the kind is stateful set here so here rabbit mq when we deploy so it is going to deploy the applications in an uh, active passive like master slave concept will be there three pods will get created and uh, one will be active and remaining will be standby concepts will be there so rabbit mq messaging queue will be there so based on that it will work and uh, elastic search so we have a concept called uh, elastic search okay log aggregation at that time i will show you by uh, showing this example using the stateful set deployment file so we can able to deploy the log aggregation okay means uh, so here what happens it will create uh, elastic search pods three pods gets created but one will become master and remaining two will become as a uh, slave so this will connect to the uh, another pod will be there kibana kibana is a dashboard front end to access the logs so kibana will always contact this machine means whoever is a master so in between it will elect this as one machine as a master and kibana dashboard will connect to that and it will collect the, all the data from the database and it will view uh, we can view in the visualization okay ga if anything happens to this part then uh, among these two it will elect another as a master and kibana will able to connect to this one and uh, the same thing it contains all the data over here also okay so th this way we can able to access the dashboard okay so in this scenario also elastic search uses stateful set okay so why because it's going to elect so immediately all the pods will not create parallelly one by one it will create then only the mechanism what it is configured for election purpose to uh select one is the master or one is the active then only it will be helpful if you use replica set or uh, another type called uh, deployment this one this one or this one it is not going to work only this one so only for few kind of applications we use stateful set not for uh, all the applications maximum all the applications we use we will go with the pa parallel should be created all the th all the pods will be as i said this examples only we use stateful set okay i will show you this example practically when we talk about efk elastic search fluent and kibana topic log aggregation at the time we use the stateful set then i'll show you practically about that coming to the daemon set daemon set also we don't use frequently so why we use daemon set in one scenario i will explain majorly this is also for locks only okay like uh, efk prometheus okay this two uh, this is for actually log aggregation most of the people will think that both are for same purpose no this is for log aggregation and this is for metrics like cpu file system network utilization disk utilization all this information will show this is logs error logs your application is corrupted or shut down stopped your server is down your uh, um, os is not working the logs to monitor to troubleshoot this is the log aggregation from which this is for metrics monitoring so we have an cluster and assume this is a cluster and uh, now as i said we need to deploy efk efk here is 
elastic search flow nd and kibana this is the three different tools we are going to install to achieve this log aggregation okay so what happens <clears throat> elastic search mm, this Okay, if you see here, this is one worker node and this is one worker node and uh, this Elasticsearch and Kibana is also deployed on one worker node. Okay, so this Kibana pod is also running on one worker node. Elasticsearch is also working on one worker node. So here Elasticsearch is to store the data, but from the worker node, how the data has been transfer to the elastic search with the help of fluent okay so e f k means this is elastic search fluent and kibana so elastic search will store the data and that data is going to be visualized we can view with the kibana dashboard but how elastic search is getting data with the help of fluent so fluent is sending the data to the elastic search so how fluent is sending it is in this worker node whatever the pods got created it will collect all the logs kubernetes logs and if you configure application logs all those logs will send it to the elastic search and this fluent is responsible is to send all these logs from this to here elastic search okay and it will store the data and this kibana will connect to the elastic search and it will send Okay, and we can able to view the data from the Kibana dashboard. So now, if this fluent D, so when I deploy this EFK deployment, okay, so this EFK deployment should be deployed with the daemon set deployment type. Why? Because the speciality of the daemon set is when I deploy this, and uh, only this fluent i am going to deploy with the daemon set elastic search already we discussed it is going to be deployed with the stateful set so we we'll, let's say we have elastic search dot yaml file inside that kind is stateful set and uh, fluent kind is daemon set okay so this fluent when i deploy this up this tool this application the kind will be daemon set why we use daemon set because when i use this if i have three worker nodes so three worker nodes what it will do three pods will go and get created inside three worker nodes in the daemon set deployment file I am not going to specify the replicas here, but still it will go and create three pods. How? Because because of this daemon set. How many worker nodes you have on those many worker nodes? One pod go and create. Let's say in future, due to heavy load, one more worker node has been created. Without any manual intervention, this fluent daemon set will go and deploy another 
flow in the pod inside this one this feature is not work with stateful set or replication controller or a replica set or maybe this deployment this is not possible because in this you are mentioning replicas how much you want two three only those many will be created and in this replica set or replication controller or deployment if you mention three it doesn't mean that compulsory those three will go and create in this three worker nodes sometimes two might be created in one machine and one might be created in another machine if the for example resources are not available in this machine maybe two might be created here one might be created here end of the day it needs three but here every worker node from every worker node we want logs should be transferred to the elastic search then in every worker node compulsory one fluentd pod should be created and it should collect all the information and then it should send it to the elastic search so elastic search also might be somewhere here or here the pod so it should send but we are talking about the fluentd pod which is getting created so if you are creating daemon set deployment then compulsory here we don't define any replicas when you deploy master knows that how many work nodes we have so it will go and deploy those many pods inside those work nodes and if new work node gets created and inside this work node also pod gets created automatically and what are the this is fluent deep pod so whatever the application pods are deployed apart from fluentd there will be lot of other pods will also get created like application pods so all the pods logs information and the cluster logs information collects by this fluentd and it will send it to the elastic search elastic search might be somewhere in this one or this one then it will send that information to the elastic search okay so in this specific scenario fluentd will be deployed with the daemon set the same way in prometheus also we have a concept called node controller then prometheus also will collect all the information from this uh, worker nodes and it will send to the prometheus server from there same like kibana we have grafana dashboard so grafana will connect to the prometheus server and it will get the information we will have a separate session for these two efk and prometheus so there we'll discuss detailedly but um, the good example for stateful set is elastic search and good example for daemon set is for fluentd okay so apart from this fluent uh, apart from uh, fluentd i never seen any real time usage for applications to be deployed for fluentd in case any such application should be deployed in each and every worker node then we may use fluentd but majorly we use uh, daemon set for fluentd only and daemon set we use it for prometheus to deploy okay so that is a another deployment app so we don't use it regularly only for this uh, fluentd or prometheus we use daemon set so we have discussed all this so this is the major important one 80 to 90 percent we use deployment to deploy the applications okay because this is the latest one introduced by the kubernetes with lot of features so how you deploy how many features you have so in deployment you have different types of deployments again so which is recreate rolling update blue green canary so these many deployment types are available inside this deployment okay so now we'll discuss so always remember in your real time you need to use this type okay so kind deployment you should use so again while using deployment if you are a product owner or maybe your application owner will ask you while you are deploying how you are going to achieve high availability how you are going to achieve uh, whenever you upgrade the applications your major uh, reason is when you are upgrading the application without downtime how we are going to upgrade the applications in the kubernetes cluster 
that is important so for that which option you are going to use recreate rolling up red blue green so we have separate uh, topics for this one okay i am taking separate session for rolling up red blue green and canary just as of now i'll just give a brief idea about it okay because we'll have a practical session for these three we cannot achieve this in practical but these three we can have a practical session okay so now i'll go to the so this is a ap version is apps v1 because this is the latest one so <coughs> so if you see here roll back to an earlier deployment version if the current state of the deployment is not stable each rollback upgrades the revision of the deployment scale up the deployment to facilitate more load Pause the deployment to apply multiple fixes to its parts template and then resume it to start a new rollout. You can pause the deployment also and uh, check up older replica sets. So here when you do deployment, along with the deployment, replica set will also get created because in the deployment.yaml file, you will define this is a kind deployment and this is the API version. And uh, here you see replicas equal to three. So because of this, back and automatically replication controller also will get created okay so here so we can use i'll just give a brief uh, introduction to this what is recreate recreate in the sense when your application is getting deployed so those applications let's say if it is using nginx image 1.14.2 here okay we are just taking an example in application for your microservice might be having some version okay so if you upgraded a new thing new uh, developers has been upgraded few things and version has been changed then that version you want to deploy then here you can create you can use recreate option okay so in this uh, specs field we get a option called strategy and there we'll use a recreate and if you deploy the applications with recreate option then what will happen so the applications will be deleted the old parts and it will create a new parts means completely it will be deleted old one and it will create a new one that is a recreate rolling update is So mostly we'll prefer rolling update so let's say your application uh, is having some version assume 1.1 version okay and the same um, you have three replicas you mentioned three replicas and uh, Now, when you mention in your deployment.yaml file here, inside the, here we'll get a option called strategy and there we'll leave you rolling update. We'll see if it is available here. That example YAML file is not available here. Maybe it will be available inside the rolling updates so inside the yaml file we'll give uh, when we deploying the applications itself at that time we'll define whether we want recreate or rolling update mostly we don't use recreate we'll use rolling update so at the time what it will do it's a by default already three parts are there and uh, again what we need to do we need to go and change the version of the application okay inside the yaml file uh, 
assume in this scenario image is 1.14.2 let's say i went and changed the image version 1. Dot, uh, some 16.2 or 15.2 something like that when i change and again when i redeploy this application means when again i am going to execute kubectl create iphone f and this um, deployment file with the latest image version this image contains latest version so what it will do first it will create one pod okay and then what it will do it will delete the old version of one pod and then it will create another pod after that it will do delete this one and then it will create third one after that it will delete this part and now these are running with the latest version okay let's say this is 1.2 so the traffic will be available here okay now afterwards you realized this is not a stable version okay the stable version is not working then you can roll back to this previous version that is possible and here not only this version let's say 1.2 is there 1.3 is there 1.4 is there like that multiple versions you these are things we can configure like how much of history we should maintain revision history based on that we can roll back to our previous version here so that again this parts will be online with this version and uh, this will be terminated so that is an advantage in the rolling update and uh, coming to the blue green is one type of uh, another type of a uh, deployment this is also majorly we use it for when we do application upgrades so how to reduce the downtime that is the major important okay reason we are using blue green or rolling update or kind of deployment so blue green deployment will be like so already one environment will be there let's say this is an environment and uh, this is a so total this will be running with the old version and this will also will be running the newer version means i am going to create uh, another deployment with the latest version but real time traffic is coming to only to these servers so what i'm going to do i'm just change the labels to the load balancer so that traffic is going to be routed here okay so parallelly both will be running but when i route the traffic the traffic will be routing here and uh, to the latest version once it is stable we can delete this or else if something happens if it is not stable then again we can route the traffic to the old pods okay this is called blue this is called green so this is called the blue green we'll see practically how we can achieve that so in the meantime now just i'll deploy this uh, deployment type okay and before that i'll delete uh, this kubectl get pods so when i was talking about a replica set so replica set responsibility is to maintain the high availability whatever the numbers we have defined so if you delete a single pod always remember don't delete the pods if you are deploying the application with deployment or replica set or stateful set because again it will recreate you need to completely delete the deployment means here kubectl get rc you need to delete this one to delete all the applications okay you should not delete the individual pod if you delete again it will get recreated so if you see kubectl delete pod because replica set or replication controller responsibility is to maintain the value what we have defined so it will recreate once again what are the pod because value is not matching we mentioned four and it is only three so immediately it started creating this one but if you delete this kubectl get rc and kubectl 
delete rc nginx rc means replication controller kubectl get rs is replica asset okay so already i am using this replica asset for one of the my like dynamic nfs provisioner okay so this is a one replica asset is available so if you want to deploy an application with replica asset we can deploy it so now i'll deploy this uh, deployment type in this one now uh, vi you can give any name deployment.yaml so this is an nginx image it is going to be deployed and if you see the remaining all these things are same if you see in the replication controller also replicas selectors is all are same okay but only the kind deployment will get more features means inside this more options you can add those options you cannot add to the remaining kind like a stateful set or daemon set so for deployment you can create a strategy here and you can add a rolling update or recreate options okay now kubectl create iphone f now kubectl get first of all we need to check deployment okay so this is the one which is getting created 37 seconds ago so this is a deployment name because it is defined inside this name is nginx and deployment that's why it is showing now if you can go and see the pods these are the three pods got deployed three has been mentioned and uh, you can see kubectl get deployments to see the deployment and uh, you can see kubectl rollout status we will discuss more about this rollout uh, command okay sorry rollout status deployment okay so deployment engine is successfully rolled out it is showing so we need to give the deployment type and the deployment name so it is showing the rollout status okay so and now if i show you rs when i was checking with the rs see here it was showing only nfs client right now i did not created replica set but automatically replica set will be get created if you see nginx deployment replica set why because this deployment is using replica set equal to 3 so that's why back end it's created replica set also okay so when i talk about rolling update and blue green i will show you why this replica sets gets created why because i am saying here uh, in the previous example i told you rolling update okay so if i want to roll back we should have this set of pods okay it will be not available but that replica set will be created that will be available okay so i will show you clearly in the practical of when you are, we are doing rolling update at that time we can see two replica sets one with this version and one with this version so when i'm doing rolling back this replica set get enabled and those parts will come online okay so when this one again these two replica sets will be available in the back end okay deployment will be one but two replica sets will be created with old image with the latest image so when you want roll back that's how it will get it from the information here that will see in the practical when we talk about um rolling update and blue green deployments okay so so updating a deployment we can update it 
so with this command if you see means uh, any image latest version if you want to update it let's say i'll execute this command or this command also you can use kubectl set image means what we are doing inside this yaml file cat um, this is the version okay so now here in this command it is using this version so it will update this email in the configuration so i open another tab I'm using watch command cubes it'll get all okay so here if you see this is for nfs client replication controller and this is for uh, nginx okay mm -hmm. okay this way i can get the image version also here okay now i'll go back here and i'll execute this command now if you see here nginx image and here if you see pods got creating here three seconds five seconds eleven seconds content creating so it's creating with new image terminating and creating new image so now all these three are running with the new image. You want to check kubectl get pods. So these are the new countries has been created. And if you want to confirm, you just browse with an IP curl HTTP and take any of the pod IP address. Hmm. There is a version here. So yesterday we were talking about the services, and uh, we discussed about uh, cluster IP service. And today we'll see um, how to configure node port IP and uh, load balancer. These are the two remaining services. Okay. So now. Uh, before discussing about configuring node port first we'll discuss the difference between cluster ip and uh, the node port so as we discussed yesterday cluster ip is for internal communication so this service we will create to access it from the different applications so this is one scenario like your databases are having multiple uh, pods and uh, this database if you want to connect from the another application then these three pods might be created in three different uh, worker nodes so each pod is having individual ip so instead of giving this individual ip you need to create a cluster ip service for this specific pods deployment so that this cluster ip and not ip okay internally we will give the name okay service discovery name we will give so whatever we created yesterday what are the name we provided to that that name we are going to give inside the application let me log into the master
So here yesterday the Occidental get SVC iPhone N Nginx iPhone Dev in this namespace we deployed the application and created the service right. This is the name will be given inside the remaining application. Maybe if this application want to connect to this database, so if we provide this service name as an my iPhone service, then this name has been provided inside this application. Okay. So applications will have properties file where it contains all the properties later stuff maybe this is connected to the database inside the cluster or maybe your database is outside the cluster okay so this kind of information will be in the application properties file so there it will be mentioned okay database equal to this ip so that it will go and access this okay apart from database it can be Diff another service also like uh, as i said we took example let's say 15 uh, microservices to run our application so now uh, these are the work nodes and assume see all the microservices whatever has been deployed has been created as an uh, service so this is a service as a only single replica and uh, this is a uh, app one and uh, this is app two and this is app three now for this we created some service like uh, node port or load balancer because these all are need to be accessed from the external world not internally so obviously we'll configure the node port or load balancer now sometimes some microservices doesn't need access from the external world some microservices need communication between them maybe this microservice is dependent on this microservice or might be this might be dependent on this one means it whenever this microservice is started so it should able to access this microservice for communication to some generate some data internet some logic will be there it doesn't require any external access means it doesn't mean that 15 microservices will be there all 15 should be need to be accessed from the external world sometimes some microservices doesn't require accessing from the external world so internally it, it is communicating with another microservice so in this scenario we'll create a cluster ip means if this microservice doesn't need uh, access from the external world then for this it will provide the service type will be cluster ip because it's not required externally so if this microservice want to access this one then what are the cluster ip service name we have provided to this service let's say we mention my service so this name will be provided inside the properties file of this application so whenever this application starts so it will go and uh, access this application if it communicates then this application will come online if due to any reason it cannot able to reach this microservice or app then this application will not come online not only on this one maybe it contains uh, external database database is outside not in the cluster maybe it's a pass service assume this is a in the cloud pass or maybe it's on premises okay it can be anything so if this microservice is dependent on it should connect to this database and it should connect to this service so if any of this database or this service is not connecting then this application will not come online okay so as an administrator kubernetes administrator we need to log in and we need to see where we need to check the logs of that application where exactly it is getting stuck we'll see errors right maybe database passwords are wrong database url is wrong maybe port cannot able to reach okay or maybe it's cannot able to uh, connect to this service from here to here so these things we need to check and we need to resolve that and i can if the application again redeploy when the application is started so it will be online only when what are the dependencies are defined inside this application if it connects to them then only it will come online okay 
so in this scenario we'll configure cluster ip for services means it no need to access from the external world so then it will configure cluster ip and internally this microservice will be used by some other apps some other microservices or some other applications so they will use this name inside their application and if this needs to be accessed from the external world then this we can configure as, as a load port or load balancer so this is another real time scenario so instead of taking this scenario because uh, i never configured maybe some organizations might be configured database also inside the kubernetes but whatever i have experience i always configure database as a separate pass service and the exact real example is cluster ip for existing microservice which doesn't require external access okay in that scenario we'll give cluster ip understood right about cluster ip now we talk about Pramil. node port yeah uh, is it like uh, internal load balancer it acts like right yes okay so if you are if this service if you maintaining uh, this app three you mentioned three replicas then this might be created inside three worker nodes so when this name has been defined here inside this properties file then whenever this application is connecting it is sending the traffic to here so it will go to this uh, cluster ip and this will send traffic to three different parts of this app three okay if you mention three replicas or two replicas if you take three example then whenever it's connecting it will connect to this name my service it's a service called a service discovery dns name so with this name it will connect this uh, ip and it will route the traffic equally to this three parts okay so this is called as a it will do load balancing so equally it will send the traffic to these three parts so if any of the pod goes wrong then uh, you know right if you are mentioning three replicas then it's replication controller or replicas at responsibility to maintain three then immediately it will create one more and again this cluster ip service will be sending traffic to that newly created pod so it's it's going to do load balancing cluster ip but only internally it will work internet can be able to access so now we talk about node port kevin uh, <clears throat> yep uh, service uh, selector name and uh, pod label name should match right yes okay whatever your pod label name you are giving that should be selector for the service yeah got it thank you so node port is an open port on every node of your cluster kubernetes transparently routes incoming traffic from the node port even if application is running on different node however a node port is assigned from a pool of cluster config node port ranges so here uh, node port there for this service kubernetes is designed to use 30000 to 32767 port range so externally whenever you want to access the service so this is an example so if you take uh, this example this is how it looks like node port so this is also for front end application only because we configure node port to access your application from the external world cluster ip is not to access from the external world internally only but if you want to access your application from the external world we need to configure service type called node port so for this node port they designed this port range 30000 to 32767 means internally in your microservice or application if the developers has written 80 or 8080 what are the port number they decided 
externally you cannot access with the same port so you should route map that port to the node port range 30000 to 32767 among this any port number you can choose it okay so this is front end like pod and uh, application developers has been given 80 port number for that and uh, so that this is the target port we call it as and same will be mapped to this port and externally when you are accessing it so this is two types if you want to decide any port number from this range then you can manually enter in the configuration file static or else dynamically it will assign port from this range 30000 to 32767 it's up to us whether you want dedicated static port you want to decide in the file so this is if you are selecting one pod the replica is equal to one means it will be deployed in one node so the node ip will be there right this virtual machine ip what are the virtual machine you have the worker node that ip and this is a virtual machine ip 192.168.1.1 and what are the port we decided 31000 with that we need to able to access so here multiple instances in same node so if you are giving one replica then it's okay then it will be created on one uh, virtual machine it means in one worker node and we can able to access if you are mentioning replicas but you have only one worker node then same this is the ip address of that machine but all the three ports are running in the same machine so from this ip you can able to access the application and internally it will tra send the traffic to all the three ports but what is the purpose of having three replicas there is no advantage right if this virtual machine goes down then all these parts will be closed so we cannot able to access the application so application should be deployed on multiple worker nodes okay so if your application is deployed on multiple worker nodes but you cannot able to access with a single ip of all the three pods so pod one pod two pod three has been created three replicas has been created but to access the application you need to use the three machines ips three worker nodes ips this way but do you think that this way can you give it to the, your customer to access the application you cannot give in this way right three ips to access and uh, it will be difficult for the high availability also. so that's why node port is not preferable for the production environment node port is only helpful when you are having single node you are deploying only single port for that it is okay but multiple nodes you are deploying multiple ports then node port is not suitable for that okay so now we'll deploy an application and we'll see how to configure this node port also most of the practicals see uh, the next topic which we are going to talk about load balancer the load balancer we cannot configure in all the environments like uh, why we choose node port for practical purpose for as a for our education purpose practical purpose mostly we'll use node ports only why because if you are not using gke or aks or uh, eks when you configure load balancer service after this which we are going to talk it is going to generate an load balancer public ip which is chargeable that we can able to access but the concept like cube adm cops or uh, on your uh, open shift if you are using so this kind of scenarios so load balancer cannot generate a public ip and you cannot access your application so when you are practicing any topic in your environment in your local environment or even in cube environment so at that time 
for that application if you want to access we'll configure node for because we are not expecting any high availability or real-time traffic we are practicing for our knowledge purpose okay maybe in future you apart from the topics what we are discussing in this course maybe a lot of other topics might be there so those topics to implement you might need some uh, service to access that application whatever you are trying to achieve to from the external world so we may configure for example let's take a, uh, you can configure jenkins master master and slave concept inside the kubernetes only means master will be also inside the uh, as a pod will be deployed and the slave also can be configured as a pod that is possible so if you are practicing this scenario your jenkins should be accessed from the master should be accessed from the external world so for that purpose what you are going to configure node pod because if you are using kubedm concept or maybe if you are using elixir containers or if you are using vagrant environment then the topic which i am going to tell in the next one the load balancer cannot generate the public ip so you cannot able to access so that's why for practical purpose for our knowledge based we'll use node port in real time for your organization if it is a gke aks or maybe uh, eks in this cloud environments kubernetes as a service it will create a public ip and company will take care of that the charges of that public ip but for us and the load balancer also chargeable okay the traffic whatever is going to come in the real time it will be chargeable so for our practical knowledge we'll use this node port but in real time we don't use node port as a service to get the real traffic in the production environment okay so now i'm going to create this uh, one deploy one application and that application i'll uh, configure service and will access that application from the external world okay let me i copied uh, these diagrams from some uh, outside external source okay because instead of drawing all these things if you get ready made and uh, that's the reason i downloaded from the internet itself so now you <coughs> see This is a deployment file is there right so previously we used the same deployment file to deploy this application which we used it for the uh, cluster service cluster ip service now what i'll do i'll delete this deployment let me check the name of the deployment deployment uh, hyphen n nginx hyphen dev kubectl delete deployment hyphen n nginx hyphen dev see you don't need to delete you can just go and modify the file and give different selector name and you can deploy so three more or two more pods are going to be created okay so nothing has been available so now i'll go to this file and what i'll do here the labels name i'm going to give as an nginx hyphen app <clears throat> and here also i'll define see this label name and this label name no need to be the same but whatever the label name you are giving here this should be the same with the service label name okay now I need to have a node port service 
YAML file. So let me copy that. So you guys can use this uh, uh, my GitHub account for YAML files, whatever I'm using as an example. So you can use that. So in this scenario for Noteport also, I'm using the same YAML file for you. For your reference, I'll show you what is the name of that YAML file. So I am using this Nginx iPhone deployment. You can take this as a reference. Okay. So this one. And here you can see the label name Nginx iPhone app. Even the same thing I've changed. You can give any label name. It's not mandatory to have Nginx iPhone app. It can be anything. Now all of this file is available inside my machine. So now I need to copy the service. So Nginx iPhone service is a node port service. So here how it will be decided type equal to node port is there. If type equal to load balancer, then this service is a load balancer and kind is a service. So this is one of the object or resource inside the Kubernetes cluster. And this is the name we are giving. So I will change the name because uh, already there is a service with this name, the cluster IP service. So again, I should not use the same one. And uh, here if you see node port 3007, so 30,007 manually i'm giving this if you don't give this line here then randomly it will pick a port from the 30000 to 32767 and this is application port which is configured inside that okay so basically nginx by default runs on 80 only that's why we are using 80 if the application is using 8080 and in the service if you are using 80 then it will not work so why here it is 80 because we are testing with nginx application which is by default uses 80 port number in real real time if your application java application or node.js application okay if it is taking any different port number they are using inside the microservice that port number you need to mention here okay and that will be mapped to this port whatever the node port you are giving so this is a label name selector means so whatever the label name has been provided for the application that is the name and this label name is for your service okay so for this service we are giving some labels so as i said if you have lot of services if you want to filter the services based upon the fraud service or dev services or based on the application service it means hundreds of applications are there i want to view the services related to so and so applications then we are giving label name to your services so this name we can give in that way so don't confuse that if you are giving this name here the same name should be also here this label name is for your service to identify and this label name this selector this is not a label name we are selector so it will go and talk with the application which is having label name with this one and it will commit it so now i'll copy this and uh, I'll create a directory called services. So I'll go inside these services and then I'll uh, node port dot yaml file just to easily recognize I'm giving this file and uh, so here important thing is I need to change the name. Node service test. 
this is the name i'm giving and type is notebook and this is a selector okay. so now uctl get pods iphone yen nginx iphone dev in the namespace nothing is there so kubectl first of all let me check the let me come out of this directory and open this file this is the file i'm using so namespace has been given here and this is a deployment and this is an app so Here also we can take it. Now kubectl create hyphen f the file name. Now kubectl get pods hyphen and nginx hyphen dev in this namespace. Three pods has been created. Now I should go inside this directory and i need to create the service to access this application from the external world so kubectl create iphone f noteport.yaml file but sorry i did a mistake because i did not mention the namespace inside this yaml file so it gets created inside the here here it got created default namespace so what i'll do kubectl delete hyphen f the same node port file and we can give see two ways you can delete so kubectl delete svc and this name the object name resource name you can give it will be deleted another way is kubectl delete hyphen f like how you created same way you can delete so the advantage is this one why because see in single file always not not mandatory to mention only single resource only in real time you will come to know slowly in a single file there will be many resources might be defined maybe service and deployment also both things you can define in a single file itself like that 10 objects you can define in a single file so that if you mention kubectl create iphone f and the yaml file it will create all the 10 objects which you mentioned inside the file sequentially it will going to create so if 10 objects you define and you are trying you did a mistake means you want to recreate it so if you are deleting with uh, each resource kubectl delete uh, uh, like uh, for example deployment and the deployment name okay this will de delete the deployment one object has been deleted and next one you want to delete svc and this will be deleted and next you can create a config maps might be created this will be deleted so instead of deleting this each and every object if you just again use delete iphon f the yaml file then whatever was created everything gets deleted you no need to delete each and every object manually separately okay so this way you can delete as of now only one object got created so i can use anything either this option or kubectl delete the object name svc and the object name also will work but i always recommend if you are creating anything from the file then always try to use delete from the file itself so it gets deleted and i'll modify this and i need to define hmm, namespace under the metadata we need to give namespace nginx hyphen dev so that it will get created now again let me create this one so kubectl get svc hyphen n nginx hyphen dev so the service has been created in the five seconds ago and uh, kubectl get svc hyphen and nginx hyphen dev so let me describe this to see the endpoints has been created or not kubectl describe 
SVC hyphen N Nginx hyphen Dev. See endpoints has been created. Okay. And if you see three thirty thousand seven port number has been allocated to it. Now this is type is called node port. And even you can access this application with this IP also. This is called node port IP. See if the service and this name we are going to access externally we cannot access with that name but internally also uh, you can give this name to access by some other application maybe uh, here we suppose we configured node port to access it from the external world but this app also dependency for this app then here we need to provide node port service name whatever the service name we have provided so let's say if this is the service name then this service name should be provided here inside this application so this will go and communicate to this application and will do the functionality whatever it is expecting the purpose of communicating it will go and communicate so the request will go to the service and this service will route the traffic to this port okay so how it is communicating so it's the name we are giving here but dns it's like a dns so the ip will be for this node port this is an ip internally that inside the kubernetes cluster this node port service is having this ip so this ip even though it is changing in future doesn't matter because always we are preferring with the dns name this is the name we are adding inside the properties file of this application so when this application is starting up it will check with this service and if it is reachable then it will go here and this service responsibility should send the traffic to that port. okay so you can test it with one, this one so internally from the cluster i am testing it so i can able to access this is a welcome to nginx page it is opening means what i can able to access it so now our intention to configure this node port is to access it from the external world so what we can do we need to take the ip of the node and we need to access it so as of now the aws machines which i created it's having two ips one is public ip and private ip in your organization obviously you will be inside the private network so you will take the private ip of your worker node so this private ip and you will access it in your organization because we will be your laptop or desktop network whatever is assigned it will be with your uh, cloud environment network only you will be in the vpn so directly you can able to access it but for now practical we cannot able to access this private network from my laptop through external world either i need to enable vpn service so that i can able to access to this private ip so we have another option called this one this is only for practical okay for our knowledge sharing only in real time you don't have this ips you'll have only this private ips to your virtual machines for your the clusters means worker nodes whatever you have those worker node ips will be there so you need to con access with that ip if you configure service with the node port so i'm not using this one i cannot able to access so i'm using this public ip of this work or not to access it from the external world uh, Praveen, so here yep we have three nodes right so hmm. which ip should we use for accessing outside so like, as of now i mentioned three replicas so three we have only two worker nodes but uh kubectl get pods iphone o wide iphone n nginx iphone dev so it is deployed on the two machines okay so here if you see on 232 machine two pods 118 on two pods so if you see here this is 232 and uh, this is 118 it's deployed on the two machines so you can take any of the public ip among these two and you can able to access it and here you need to give the port number 
30,007. Then only we can able to access. And one more thing you need to keep in your mind that we allowed all traffic inside the security groups of this AWS virtual machines. So that's why we can able to access in real time. It will be not the same scenario. So whichever ports are required, if you are managing that security part, then you need to enable the ports. Or if some other team is managing it, then you need to raise a request so that that ports will be allowed. Basically, whenever you are creating a cluster, always uh, will give them the prerequisite to enable ports from 30,000 to 32,737 by default for the cluster. Okay, so if you create a single pod, then wherever that pod is get deployed, so you can able to access the pod of that particular worker node. Okay, as of now, I mentioned three replicas, so three has been created in two worker nodes, so that's why I can able to access it here. So as I said, this is not recommended for production traffic, so we should use the type is called load balancer okay so now we talk about the service called load balancer So load balancing is uh, see load the name load balancer means for remaining two services also will be doing the load balancing service okay cluster ip will also do the load balancing what i've said here uh, this way if this uh, name has been using by some other application the traffic is coming here then the cluster ip will also do the load balancing node pod also will do and load balance will also do the usage of is different For load balancing external traffic to ports each with different trade-offs so theoretically So what load balancer will do it will also be the same so load balancer when we configure for this uh, so what are the disadvantage in the node port that will be resolved so here multiple worker nodes will be there and uh, whatever the ports has been created so it will be created as a service and from external the traffic will be coming to this load balancer and load balancer will route the traffic internally to this pods So load balancer service is the standard way to expose a service to the internet. So this article is specifically talking about GKE. This will spin up a network load balancer that will give you a single IP address that will forward all traffic to your service. So whatever the load balancer we configure, so it will get one IP address and all the traffic will come to that load balancer. So internally it will route the traffic to this pods. 
so when would you use this if you want to directly expose a service this is a default method all traffic on the port you specify will be forwarded to the service so here what are the port you configure for your service manually we can define same like node port here also from 32,000 30, to 32,767 we can define a port so what are the traffic is coming from the external so it is going to send the traffic so here a uh, little bit tricky between inside the cubarium what we configure and uh, inside the kubernetes as a service like uh, gke or maybe aks and eks i never tried in eks so i tried with gke and aks so internally whenever you are creating a load balancer in a kubernetes service externally means in the cloud side also it will create one load balancer and that will receive the traffic and that load balancer will send your kubernetes uh, load balancer sir for this service and it will send the traffic to this one so whatever this load balancer is getting created this is chargeable okay but if you are creating load balancer in the kubedm concept means in the virtual machines you created whether it's maybe vmware or maybe back and it may be cloud doesn't matter it's a kubedm concept it's not a kubernetes as a service so it will not create any extra load balancer inside the cloud environment or maybe inside the vmware environment but specifically inside the gke or aks separate one load balancer gets created like uh, uh, i'm not sure how many of you are aware about uh, aws or uh, aks or gke forget about kubernetes previously you have heard the load balancer concept in the cloud right the load balancer concept in aws also we have application load balancer classic load balancer network load balancer concepts are there and even gk is also load balancer concept is there we can create load balancing uh, for multiple applications that load balancer gets created when you create kubernetes load balancer this is one so let me so so would we don't want to create a load balancer externally right definitely we'll if we are creating a load balancer service in a kubernetes as a service whether it's maybe gke or aks okay this is the service and type is load balancer the type is load balancer then automatically in the cloud level it will create a load balancer and traffic will come to this load balancer and here internally it will send this load balancer and it will send the traffic to the pods but if you do same concept with the cubedium even the virtual machines are from aks or azure but if you have a worker nodes in this way and you created a service it is not going to create any ex external load balancer okay only this internal load balancer will be there but this is not going to get any public ip it will not generate any, it will show in a pending state okay so again you need to access it from the node port ip only so that's why in the kubedm or maybe here we cannot configure this one So the big downside is that each service you expose with a load balancer will get its own IP address. Means um, here, these three uh, parts of your application you created service load balancer. This will get an IP address, and another set of uh, service microservice. For example, you have 15 microservices. For 15 microservices, you are deciding uh, load balancers, or maybe for 10 you are deciding remaining all are cluster IPs. So for 10, you are going to get it. Ten IPs. Each load balancer is going to get a 10 IPs. And you have to pay for load balancer per exposed service. And this you have to pay line will apply only if you are creating this load balancer inside the AKS or GKS because external load balancer also gets created okay 
so to avoid that and uh, this means there is no filtering no routing etc this means you can send almost any kind of traffic to it like http traffic tcp traffic udp traffic so in the load balancer you cannot configure the traffic rules okay routings so for that ingress controller will come into the picture we have a separate session for that okay first of all you guys need to understand this uh, services into practice in the later on sessions okay i am going to discuss about the ingress controller so ingress in this you can configure the routing everything okay how to get the traffic whether it's http traffic tcp traffic all the things will be configured inside this ingress okay so ingress will be something like this and these are your services maybe this is load balancer 1 load balancer 2 load balancer 3 and this app 1 app 2 app 3 and this ingress controller you can configure in this way you can route the traffic well okay so now we'll see how to configure the load balancer so if you can see nginx siphon service siphon lb this you can see and type is load balancer and port i different 31000 okay and uh, name i need to change it again and then give the namespace details and before this i need to delete the existing deployment or you can maintain that you need to change the, all the names so instead of that i'll delete it so kubectl get deployments hyphen in nginx hyphen dev so kubectl delete deployment nginx hyphen kubectl get pod siphon in nginx hyphen dev okay I did not give the namespace hyphen in nginx hyphen dev. Kubectl get pod hyphen in nginx hyphen dev. So we are doing this on specific namespace. I hope everyone understood namespace. So now again I am going to use the same file that uh, deployment file and this time I'm going to change the label name so here I'll give iPhone LB extra I'll add it iPhone LB and uh, let me deploy this kubectl create iphone a created kubectl get pod siphon n nginx hyphen dev got created now i will copy this yaml file for load balancer service and uh, i'll go to the service directory and uh, here i will lb.yaml this is the name i'm giving and i need to change the name first of all so here my service lb i'm giving because already my service is there so here selector i think i gave lb this is the name I'm giving and internal application is 80 port number and externally we want to access from the 31,000 okay the type is load balancer now save it and before that one thing I forgot to mention namespace So this is the namespace 
and now I'm going to create it. What created kubectl get svc hyphen n nginx hyphen dev. Now third one is also got created. And if you see here, it shows in a pending state. It will not allocate external IP. So if you see kubectl describe svc iPhone n nginx hyphen okay so these are the endpoints but this ip will not show it will not allocate but if you create it in the gke or ks it will get created okay if tomorrow if time permits i will show you in the gk the same cluster if you create how it will get the ip address and how we can able to access so always remember whenever you create the service for specific applications make sure the endpoints is configured properly based upon the selectors so sometimes as i said yesterday we do mistake while giving the labels names or selectors so that it cannot pointing or mounting or mapping to that respective application two it will two different objects will be created but there will no be intercommunication between them if you do any single mistake inside the selector okay so now so how to access it from the external world we can try it with the node port like node ip what is the port number three one zero 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 Okay, so we can able to access it. But with the node port IP, even though you configure load balancer, load balancer doesn't have any IP. So here, one more disadvantage is if, if you are using node port, if the node port IP is changed also, there is a drawback, right? Again, you'll get a new IP. But load balancer, when you configure, whatever the IP you configured, that will be for the load balancer IP. So this way we can configure different services. So tomorrow I will show you the same load balancer to configure inside the GKE cluster. And then tomorrow we'll talk about different components like config maps, secrets, okay, node selectors, node selectors. These are the topics we are going to discuss. Any doubts in today's session, please ask me or else we'll wind up for today's class. ingress also we are discussing tomorrow right ingress not tomorrow that will be later on or once everyone is familiar with these services topics because all together if you're talking on the same time then people might not understand because some might not from the networking background or some might not mm -hmm. from uh, devops completely so people everyone is familiar with these services if everyone practice in the later on sessions, I will explain about that Nginx Ingress controller. Okay. Okay. So, uh, guys, please do practice and a uh, lot of things you need to do RD. I'll give one example scenario. So I'm telling you the selector, uh, the deployment. So, you need to try that and tell me in the WhatsApp group. So, I'm going to do two deployments. Okay. So, for two deployments, I want to give Nginx siphon app. Is it going to work? And uh, if I create a service with selector, if really works with two names, two deployments with same label names, when I'm creating a service with Nginx siphon app, then for which deployment it is mapping, you need to tell me that. Okay, then how it will take? If two deployments are there, two different microservices or two different applications having same label name. And when you create a service, the service is recognizing with the label name. Then if two deployments is having same names, then how it is going to point? So that you need to do R&D. Like, like this, 
so once you complete the basic things what we are discussing in the class then you can do r and d stuff okay so today you need to do this uh, lab and uh, ping me in the whatsapp group which we have okay then we'll discuss over there yes someone is asking can please go ahead. Uh, uh, actually yesterday i will uh, create the cluster ip i'm not able to send the end points uh, like a pods container simple, as i said the two maybe the selector is wrong so you ping me the deployment.yml file what you used and show me the selector what you are using there and show me the selector in service.yml if the selector is not matching then your service cannot recognize the proper application and then it will not point to that application pods so okay. if you're not able to see endpoints that means it's not pointed to that application why it's not pointed maybe selector is not correct maybe it's mismatch okay i will ping you on our whatsapp yep yeah thank you Pravin? yeah yeah each namespace is isolated with each other right yes uh can we make a connection between the namespaces like uh, vpc peering concept in aws see here namespace when you are using namespace let's say uh, that is what i was telling like once you explore the basic things then i can give you some task like for example uh, this is a namespace one and uh, this is namespace two okay i'm creating a service here let's say load balancer service so this service you can point it to this deployment here whatever you do deployment so this service can also you can use it here it's not like for example this service you cannot use for this deployment so service can able to use it so some uh, not uh, let me confirm config maps Service. Yep, I think service can be used. Okay, if time permits, just do an R and D. Deploy the application in different namespace. Deploy the load balancer in different namespace, and give the label names. Okay, so I think mostly it will connect to that. But config maps, secrets. Uh, image pull secrets will not work okay means config map you created in this namespace and this config map you are giving the application deployment in a different namespace will not work secrets will not work okay i think service will work you just try it okay yeah yeah thank you Okay, so today we talk about a uh, um, topic called namespace and uh, we'll discuss about the services. Okay, so in the meantime, what I'll do, I'll create a uh, cluster and then we'll discuss theoretically about namespace until it creates uh, the cluster. And then we can do practical. So are you guys doing practical? this whatever we discussed till in the last class yes So anybody have idea about what is namespace? Uh, Pravin, it's like uh, one logical isolation entity on top of the Kubernetes, where you can deploy your Kubernetes resources. Okay. It's an object. Object? Okay, 
so it's getting created okay. so let's discuss about uh, namespace if you go and search for theatrical this so namespaces are kubernetes objects which partition a single kubernetes cluster into multiple virtual clusters so each kubernetes namespace provides the scope for Kubernetes names it contains, which means that using the combination of an object name and a space. So I'm not sure how many of you understand this. So let me explain in a detailed way. See, in Kubernetes, we have a concept of namespace. So we have a lot of objects inside the Kubernetes like uh, pods are there deployments are there we discussed right uh, like we we're talking about uh, for example pod if you create replication controller RC stateful set deployment daemon set and apart from this lot of other objects is also there okay like service like whether it's a load balancer or cluster if you node port or volumes or jobs config maps secrets okay so these are the some of the objects we have in the kubernetes many more objects are also there now all these objects we are going to create inside the default namespace so we have a different namespaces will be available so first of all, what is this namespace? Namespace is like a virtual cluster, which means, for example, your application is having 15 microservices. It means to run your application completely, maybe your complete website to run, assume 15 microservices are there. So each microservice you are going to deploy inside the cluster. Okay, so you have assume uh, three worker nodes and uh, inside these three worker nodes you are deploying your application so for first uh, microservice when you are deploying maybe each microservice is dependent on multiple objects of the kubernetes maybe if it is a stateful application then it's need um, volume so in the configuration file in the deployment configuration file you need to define about the volume also and uh, apart from that you need to have um, config maps okay what is config maps config maps is a um, object which we use for an application to mention the properties of that application so properties means what see uh, this database want to connect to some other application part there should be communication between these two so it should this database should have the details of this specific application details maybe ip and port number or maybe this application want to connect to this database then it should have the database name port number username password everything should be available inside the properties file so by using that properties file it will go and connect to this database so this properties file we can have inside the config maps okay so that is one of the object inside the kubernetes so that need to be provided for this application so config maps volumes secret what is secret secret like you know ansible vault and you know docker also is having secret so what it contains you are encrypting the credentials okay basically it will not encrypt it's an encoding so when you are providing the credentials like i said in the config maps you will provide the credentials to go and connect here but only for specific credentials you can use secrets so that it will use as an uh, encoded credentials to go and connect to the database 
remaining all the properties like uh, port number, uh, IP of the database, all these things will be defined in the config maps. But uh, it's in the plain text. So that's why we don't provide credentials inside the C uh, config maps. Credentials can be provided in the secret. And that secret we will define inside the application YAML file. So that is also one of the object. So like this one microservice may be using multiple objects to run. So all these objects need to be created. So here when this is a cluster which we are getting created. Assume you deployed all these 15 microservices and this is called as a uh, dev environment. So all the 15 microservices have been deployed and respective objects is also has been deployed. Now you want another environment called staging environment. Okay. For staging environment, again, what you need to do, uh, you need to create a new cluster. New means new physical infrastructure you need to create. Whether it's in a Kubeadium concept or whether it's in Google Cloud, GKE, whatever it may be. So you need to have another setup of cluster, another resources. But this existing cluster, whatever created, this cluster still remains a lot of resources. So what we can do, we can create the same kind of set of this uh, microservices, 15 microservices as a staging environment in the same cluster, but not on the same namespace. So we'll create a different namespace and under that namespace, we'll deploy all these 15 microservices inside that one. Okay, inside the new namespace. So whatever the resources was created, the objects was created for these 15 microservices, whether it's maybe secrets, config maps, volumes, deployments, same you are going to create again, but in the different namespace. So you can give that namespace as a staging namespace. Okay, just a second. Yes. Okay, I'm back. So this another set of application you can deploy inside the same cluster if these machines have enough resources. If, if it doesn't have resources, you cannot deploy because uh, 
if the CPU RAM is occupied by these 15 microservices for these worker nodes, then you cannot deploy. Or else, again, what you need to do, you need to add more worker nodes to your cluster. If it is an GKE AKS, then automatically they get created with the help of auto scaling concept. But if it is a bare metal QBDM concept, okay, then you need to manually add worker nodes into this cluster. Then you can deploy. Okay, that is the purpose of this namespace. And not only to have different environments also. See, you have single environment only, but you don't want all the resources should be created under the single namespace only. Like for example, this 15 microservices you deployed. For this, you need additional uh, pods or additional applications you want to deploy, deploy like EFK and uh, Prometheus, Grafana, you want to deploy. Why? Because EFK is for log aggregation to capture the logs and uh, we can see the logs through the Kibana dashboard and uh, Prometheus is for metrics monitoring your CPU, memory, file system. Okay, so this matrix network utilization, disk utilization, that will be captured by the Prometheus. So we will install this uh, application and we'll monitor. So what in real time, what we recommend, in the single namespace, I don't want to see all the parts of my microservices, uh, my applications, and in the same namespace, I don't want to see these parts of uh, Elasticsearch and Prometheus Grafana. I want to separate it. Then what we can do, we can create a separate namespace and uh, under that namespace, we can able to access, uh, like create this EFK related pods. And uh, for Prometheus, we can create, uh, so Prometheus, something you can give uh, DIT or staging, something like this, you can give and inside that namespace, you can deploy what are the requirements like apart from parts what else it is getting created all the things will be created under this namespace so that you are separating your application parts or in separate namespace and uh, your logs and uh, monitoring related stuff you are deploying inside the different namespace so when you are going to check the resources of specific namespace so kubectl get all okay namespaces if you give then it will provide the uh, information of that specific namespace okay give the namespace name so that specific namespace information is going to be provided by default let me check whether it's get created okay it got created By default, when you uh, create cluster, whether QBDM concept or maybe GKE or AKS, you'll have by default namespaces has been created. Now we'll see what are those namespaces by default it get created. The cloud shell is getting created so that we can access that cluster Okay, so this is a command we will execute to get, as I said, that config file will be copied into local so that we can able to access the cluster. 
and kubectl uh, get namespaces so these are the default namespaces are available so this is a default namespace okay and these are some other namespaces are available so here when you create a cluster some pods gets created related to the components which we discussed in the kubernetes architecture the kube proxy and a kubelet and a api server etcd related to that pods gets created which will maintain those components all those it's like for example when you install the operating system in linux operating system all the os related stuff will be there right in the slash like usr bin which is contents of os related stuff same way your cluster related stuff will be available inside this namespace kubectl cube iphone system when i type kubectl get pods any resource not only pods okay anything if you check okay so in default uh, this will go and check in the default namespace so when you are not giving any namespace it means it's checking in the default namespace if you want to check in specific namespace then hyphen n unity q q hyphen system so this they don't want to include kubernetes cluster software related pods inside the default namespace that's why they have a separate namespace called cubes cube iphone system and all these pods get launched inside this namespace okay so you can see cube proxy cube dns some metric server so these are some default uh, kubernetes related pods has been created this is a default means created namespaces so here in this article it has been provided so what is this each and every namespace so if you see cube iphone public namespace for resources that are publicly available readable by all and the default catch all namespace for all objects not belong to either of the q public or q system namespaces so the default namespace is used to hold the default set of pods services and deployments used by the cluster if you are not telling where to create then by default will go and create in the default namespace so when we were uh, practicing to uh, create the pods if you remember deployments whether it may be normal deployment or uh, directly we are creating a pod so i was not telling where to create in which namespace so by default we'll go and create in the default namespace okay so let me create any pod from here okay so i am going to deploy nginx with the type kind called uh, deployment okay so with this yaml file i am going to create it so now i'll copy this and uh, i'll go to the shell so vi nginx siphon deployment dot yaml
why it is not getting copied. I think we need to do something to copy into that console. Uh, <clears throat> It's not getting cancelled. Open timer. It is getting the same turn. What is the drop down next to the plus sign? Yeah, next to that, yeah. Okay. It's opening another one, I think. Establishing connection. Okay, so now what I'll do, I'll do uh, git clone this copy paste is not working here. I think we need to do something to copy from the outside. For AKS, we don't need to do anything.
I do one thing and enable my uh, AWS nodes. I'll see later on uh, how to like copy the content inside this cloud shell. Okay, so as I said, you can create a namespace. So for single set of applications also, you can create different namespaces and uh, you can deploy different types of components in different namespace, okay? So here, but this, whatever you configure these microservices to communicate each other, they should be in the same namespace. Okay, if you create five of them in one namespace and another five of them in different namespace, then they will not connect properly. Okay, so that's why you should create these in the same namespace. And uh, another thing is the name. Names are very, very important here. So what are the names you are giving uh, for your namespace? Okay, means for your applications, for example, Here we have an deployment. Let's say this is I'm going to deploy Nginx Siphon deployment. Here I'm giving this deployment name is Nginx Siphon deployment, right? In the same namespace, again you cannot create the deployment name with the Nginx Siphon deployment. It will tell all this is exists. But if you create in the different namespace with this name, it will create in the different namespace. But it cannot create in the same namespace with this name. So this is kind is deployment here kind means lot of objects will come whether it's a config map volumes or uh, any secrets. Okay service. So all these things What are the name you are giving to that with the same name in the same namespace? You cannot create so you need to give different names, but with the same name you can create in the different namespace And uh, if you're configuring, if you're creating anything through the YAML files, then here you are going to give the namespace. Below this name, we are going to give the namespace equal to the namespace name. It means we are telling this should be created under this specific namespace.
okay so if you check kubectl get namespace so here uh, i created this namespaces but by default you don't see this namespace okay only you'll see cube node please public and we'll see what are the components are available inside this get all iphone in cube iphone public i want to see all the components of this nothing is available and uh, cube get all iphone n and um, cube iphone system so these are the components has been created inside this cube system namespace these are the pods right and uh, these are the services got created the topic which we are going to discuss now after finishing this namespace and this is a daemon set we already discussed okay daemon set and uh, this is a deployments so the types of uh, deploying the applications we discussed replica set replication controller stateful set daemon set and deployment so here if it is deployed daemon set means what already we discussed means it expecting each and uh, uh, the pod should be created in each and every worker node so if you see this is for calico pod so when we deploy this application through kubeadm so it is expecting whatever the worker node it is having in each and every worker node the calico pod should go and create and if new worker node has been added automatically daemon set responsibility to deploy that pod inside the new worker node because this is networking so that's why all the worker nodes should be in that network that's why this calico when i deployed the yaml file it is configured with the daemon set deployment that's why we can see daemon set okay so instead of looking each individual resource you can get it all information with kubectl get all and this is for kube proxy and remaining all are normal deployments like we discussed the last uh, deployment type was deployment so if you deploy any application with stateful set then that is also it will show it will show all the resources so as of now these are the resources has been created inside this cube system okay now if i check cube system get all i'm not giving any namespace here so it will take by default namespace so these pods are got created and these are different pods compared to these pods okay so these are the pods in this deployment is running here and these many services has been created for uh, different uh, services and uh, this is a deployment and these are the replica sets okay and this is a job is also running for this one now this very resources has been created so all the resources we can check of that particular namespace now mm, let me take any let's say this is a deploy so this is one of the deployment of nginx deployment so this we can deploy inside the uh, specific namespace so what we can do while i did this so below this below metadata namespace nginx dev, something namespace we can give and then i will create it kubectl create I finish. But this name space should be already available when you are defining in the YAML file that you are telling it to go and create this 
deployment on this namespace. But if it is not available, then it cannot able to create it. So you should create it manually by default. But still, I'll try to create it. See what it is telling? Error not found when creating deployment.yaml namespace engine is not found. It doesn't have it will not create by default. So it should already there, then only this deployment will go and create the resource inside the namespace. So let me create it. kubectl create namespace and this namespace okay it's done now again if i execute the same command to create this deployment it got created now if you want to check kubectl get pods here you can't see that in the because when i'm typing kubectl get pods it is referring to the default namespace so when you check kubectl get pods hyphen n nginx iphone dev here they got created 21 seconds ago it got created okay so that is the purpose of this namespaces so that you can um, create resources in different namespaces okay but few resources will not belongs to any namespace those are volumes and nodes if i check kubectl get nodes nodes will be not belong to any namespace okay and uh, kubectl get pv volumes also okay so volumes will also be not not belongs to any of the um, namespace but remaining all these are belongs to the namespaces okay understood or can you repeat that statement please <clears throat> see we are talking about the resources right kubernetes resources of uh, like uh, services jobs um, pods deployments config maps secrets these all are the resources so all these resources will be part of some namespace when you create it but when you create volumes when you're adding the nodes these two will be not belong to any of the namespace It's like a global namespace. So uh, the volume will not be in any of the namespaces, either by either default or any other created namespaces. Sorry. I said the volume will not be in any of the namespaces. Yes. Oh. Uh, Praveen, okay. uh, yeah. uh, how can we apply this network policies like firewall on this namespace? What kind of network policies? Uh, firewall policies. See, here internally you are not applying any firewall policies. If you are talking about Nginx or uh, maybe Istio, that will be separate. Okay, so the resources, whatever you are using. Now we'll talk about the services. Once we complete the services, then you might understand, okay, about what you are uh, like thinking about the firewall rules or whatever it may be. See, we don't compare firewalls here we'll just configure uh, service to access this application from the external world okay so will be configured firewalls anything will be under the load balancer or maybe uh, if you're having nginx ingress controller or maybe istio service mesh there you are going to configure everything because from external world traffic is coming to that service mesh or uh, 
nginx ingress controller from there the traffic will send to the internal so internal no need of any firewalls here okay so i so, hope you understood so, yep. so where do yep. these names gets created is it inside a node or where this is inside the cluster it will get created okay so it is outside the node basically if i'm not wrong to outside the node in the sense in the in the kubernetes cluster software it will get created oh okay, okay. See, outside the node means where it will, where is your cluster is running on your nodes itself right nodes. yeah 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 so that it will get created fine fine understood so why we are creating here separate grafana namespace and uh, why we have prometheus namespace efk log if you see kubectl as of now i deleted uh, all the resources kubectl get um, nothing has been there only services has been left so when i want to go and uh, check elastic search related stuff i'll go and see in the efk log if I want to go and see the Prometheus related stuff, I'll go and see inside the Prometheus namespace so that all the stuff, whatever has been created, so it will be inside the Prometheus. So if everything under the default namespace, then it will be full of messy because all the resources will be in the same namespace. So when you type kubectl get parts, it will show your application parts, it will show your EFK part uh, parts, and it will show Prometheus, Grafana pods all together. So instead of that, we can separate them, we can deploy them in the separate namespace so that whenever you want, we can go and check in the separate namespace also. That way you can use, as I said, if you want to deploy multiple environments inside your organization, then dev environment, staging environment, that is also possible. But mostly we don't prefer, but if you are having a budget problem, you don't want to create another cluster, so in the same cluster you want to manage it then you can create another namespace and all the necessary things again you can deploy so again there also for this 15 microservices this dev you are not going to create all this efk prometheus Grafana also inside the dev namespace for this what will you efk fn dev prometheus fn dev Grafana fn dev namespace will create and it will belong to this dev and for staging related microservices i can will create efk fn stage Prometheus FN stage, Grafana FN stage namespaces, and those will be belongs to this one. Okay. So that's how you can configure uh, your resources inside that. And now we'll talk about the services part. Okay. So. Levin? Yeah. For production, we should maintain a separate cluster, right? Yes, the complete uh, new setup will be there with a lot okay. of uh, security will be updated inside that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so. So services, which is very, very important. So service is an abstraction which defines a logical set of parts. So here, if you go into the Kubernetes documentation and even for namespace also, if you go to the uh, Kubernetes uh, documentation, then you'll get a lot of information. So namespaces are intended for use in environments with many users spread across multiple teams or projects. So working with namespaces, these are the default namespaces which we talked about it. And uh, while you are creating the deployment through command line, if you are uh, see, not only through the YAML files, you can create the pods with the command line also, kubectl run, like how we are using uh, docker run iphone it nginx or uh, CentOS image, it will pull the image and will create the container. Same way we can create through the kubectl run command also. Same like docker run command and the uh, name and this is the image which we are giving and iphone namespace in that specific namespace that container 
the pod gets created so i was using the example of one using yaml file so in the command line if you are creating then you should give the namespace here if it is a yaml file in the configuration file you need to give namespaces so and so namespace okay so service here we have three types of services are available one is cluster ip another one is node port and uh, another one is load balancer okay so these services works with the concept called selectors okay so now why we need these services why because let's say we deployed application one of the application and this application you mentioned uh, three replicas and uh, these three replicas are deployed on three worker nodes and each pod is assigned with an ip address by default pod uh, range ip range will be separate and that ip range will be having some ip address okay so here if you see 192.168.1.14 192.168.1.15 some ips has been assigned to this pod so to access this so kubectl get pods hyphen n nginx hyphen dev and uh, if you want more information hyphen o wide so here how we can access just checking curl http and the pod ip address to check whether it's working fine or not yes nginx page is opening okay and same way for this one also 103 also same you can see 103 also same it's getting open 113 okay three pods are opening okay this ip is different curl so we are testing from cluster internally the pages are opening the nginx website is working fine assume this is an application then same way you can test it but this application should be accessed from the external world not from the cluster itself internally it is accessing but you cannot give customer to log into the cluster and to execute curl command right the purpose of this application should be accessed from the external world so how it can be accessed the external world for that purpose we need to create the service for each application or each you can call it as a microservice and here you are mentioning high availability for three okay and these ips you cannot give three ips this is internal pod ips this cannot in be accessed from the external world so how we can access we have three types cluster ip uh, node port and service uh, load balancer so first we'll talk about cluster ip so here where it is cluster ip so cluster ip exposes the service on a cluster internal ip choosing this value makes the service only reachable from within the cluster so this is the default service type so the first thing cluster ip means this will not expose to the external world but internally it will help in which way let's say you have uh, front end pods and back end pods assume these are front end pods these are called as a front end front end means web application and these are back end assume these are database mysql database has been deployed as a pods now this application needs back end database should be connected then how it will be connected they cannot give these pods ips inside this front end application so that it can communicate they can give but which ip width they will give and these parts are not immortal okay anytime they can delete again new pod will get the new ip if you check here um, 
I'll delete one part. Kubectl delete part and hyphen n nginx hyphen dev. So I'm giving the namespace. So sometimes we'll forget to give the namespace. Then it will tell this part is not present in the default namespace. Okay. So when you are seeing information with iPhone uh, and Nginx, then for deleting also, you should give the full namespace. Now, if you see get parts, new part has been created. And if you see the IP, 24 seconds, 70 IP, 89.70. So IP is getting changed. So you cannot give the IP here. It's not permanent IP here. Then how these applications will connect to this backend. So in this scenario internally, you can create a service called a cluster IP. So this will help you in this cluster IP. These ports will be configured. Okay. Now this cluster IP you are going to configure inside the front end application so that it will connect to the cluster IP and this will route the traffic to this specific ports. So how cluster IP knows that which port it should send the traffic and when new port gets created how cluster IP knows that new port gets created. Okay. So here, if you see for you see this is the service. So the kind is service. The important section for the service is called selector. We already discussed previously also selector. So if you see selector in the deployment, when you are deploying an application, there you are going to give a selector name. That selector we are going to define inside the service that okay this is a selector okay then it will go and connect with that application if the selector is not matching then it service will be created but it will not point to the application okay so main important is selector see here okay so I did not mention here any cluster IP here by default it means it's a cluster IP concept and if you see this is the name of this my service and if you see labels is nginx iPhone app and uh, selector if you see app nginx iPhone app okay so now here main important in this service is selector means any deployment parts which got created with label name equal to nginx siphon app then it will be pointed to that specific parts so if i go back nginx siphon app right and uh, nginx deployment so if you see here for this is a deployment and this is a map okay i will show you practically how we can already we deployed this application right with the same deployment file i think so kubectl describe part let me confirm whether this contains same hyphen n nginx hyphen dev Okay, this is different. If you see labels equal to nginx is there, not nginx siphon app is there. Okay, so if you see nginx app equal to nginx. So now what I'm going to do, I will take this uh, service, I'll remove here from nginx siphon app to nginx. Okay. Not this one. Uh, where is the service? Nginx siphon service. Hmm. 
now bi nginx hyphen service dot yaml and here i'll change the label name only nginx okay this is a service is getting created so i'm saving this file and if you check kubectl get svc for service the object name is svc iphone n nginx iphone dev in this namespace there is no services has been configured but if you check kubectl get svc in the default namespace you can see few services has been configured if you see here if you create cluster ip you can see this is the cluster ip okay and if you configure node port this will be the node port if you configure load balance these are the three services we are going to talk about as of now i'll tell about cluster ip and tomorrow we'll discuss about node port and uh, load balancer so now i created this file called nginx siphon service and uh, but i did not mention uh, the namespace so let me mention the namespace here in the metadata section above the name or below the name wherever you want you can give namespace nginx hyphen dev so inside that it should go and create because application parts also got created over there in that namespace so for that application we are configuring this one okay sorry this is a type is node port So here we have only single port and selector we are giving only nginx and uh, i'll give namespace nginx hyphen dev so inside this it should get created okay now save this and uh, create it kubectl create hyphen f nginx hyphen service now if you check kubectl get svc hyphen n nginx hyphen dev the service port this has been created okay then how to confirm whether this is pointing to that application okay for that you need to kubectl describe svc and uh, this service name what are the name it has been created okay see if i'm not giving namespace it is telling not found because it will check in the default namespace nginx hyphen dev these are important endpoints okay whenever you configuring even when i was initial days when i was working on the kubernetes cluster i was configured application and i configured service but i cannot able to access the application with the service ip whatever you created not cluster ip anything so why because 
I was giving a wrong selector name. Okay, so like for example, this is a SAS, and I was giving like for example platform as a service. So I was giving this is a mistake. So in the deployment file, I give PAAS as a name. Okay, uh, selector name. But in the service file, I was given PASS. So it did not find any application. Service gets created and deployment is created. But when you're trying to access it, backend it did not find any application with that selector. So there is no endpoint has been created. If you remember, while we're talking about Kubernetes components, I told the control manager. Okay. So node controller will be there, replication controller will be there, endpoint controller. So endpoint means these are called endpoints will be created. So that this is the endpoint controller responsibility to maintain these endpoints. So what are these point, ports? These are these, uh, what is this IP? These are the IPs of ports. If you clearly see kubectl uh, get ports iPhone n nginx iPhone dev iPhone wide. Okay, so these are the ports IPs 103, 113, 70. So with the help of this service, so service even if you new port deleted, then again what I'll do, kubectl delete port, and I'll delete one of the iPhone and Nginx iPhone dev. Then automatically it will come to know to the uh, service why because new port whatever it gets created, it will get created with the same selector name, the label. So again it will pick up. Okay, new port has been created with 95 and here there is no endpoint right previously with 95 p then again we'll try to check that Now you can see 95 this is how the Cluster IP service will recognize here mainly with the selector the important concept is selector if you do any mistake in selector the name uh, Spelling mistake in the name uh, this selector whatever the selector you have given for the label name you are given for this application The same it should be available here then only it will find out Okay, so this is for internal as I said cluster IP is not to access from the external kubectl get ports iphone n I'm sorry get SVC iphone n uh, nginx iphone dev so curl http It's taking time so this is for internal from in this front end then we'll configure this cluster related IP so that it can connect to this cluster IP and then it will send the traffic to this internal ports so this is for internal communication so tomorrow we'll talk about what is node port and what is load balancer okay if you have any doubts you can ask me or else we'll wind up for today's session How can we give this port mapping between cluster IP and ports? Cluster IP and ports. Port mapping means what you want to do? Suppose I want to use uh, uh, for ports port 80 and club for cluster IP like port uh, 8080. That you need to define inside this uh, service. So, what are the service we are creating here? Okay. Nginx iPhone service. So here we need to give that port. So whatever the internal port is there and what the external port you want to map that you can give. Okay. Is there any order like for creation? Like we have to create port first and then service later. 
not an issue you can create basically one by one slowly will come to the helm charts right so in the helm charts all together will be one single helm chart like you config maps as of now we are going to create individually the requirements but in the coming sessions when we talk about helm charts in the helm chart it will be all together in a single helm chart for example volume or config maps secrets service for that application and that application all together will be in a single helm chart so when you deploy it will take and automatically it will create in an order thanks praveen so in today's session we are going to talk about um, config maps okay so what is the purpose of this config maps and how to create it how many different types of ways to create this config map we'll discuss So what is config map? Config map is an API object used to store non-confidential data in key value pairs. So pods can consume config maps as environment variables, command line arguments, or as configuration files in a volume. So config map allows you to decouple environment specific configuration from your container images so that your applications are easily portable. <clears throat> and uh, main important thing is config map does not provide secrecy or encryption if the data you want to store are confidential use secret rather than a config map okay so what is the purpose of this config map is generally hmm, So assume this is our uh, infrastructure environment and uh, assume this might be the, our machines. Okay. So now whenever you are deploying any application, whether it's a microservice or full fledged application. Okay. So when you're deploying the applications, uh, applications will have some properties. I will show you application, one of the application. Mm. directly and go to the this is one of the java spring boot application which is called pet clinic for uh, pets we can create a website with this spring boot application we have a free is an open source uh, application so in the github we can able to get the source code the complete application okay and uh, you see whenever i think when you are doing the devops practice at that time you might be using java uh, as an example to build the application in the maven when we were discussing maven you might be discussed about uh, mvn clean deploy install right at that time you might seen the structure web application structure directory structure the main and test will be there in the real time also same if the java application is there main means the content will be inside the main the code and um, test cases will be written inside the test directory so if you go to the in directory uh, here you can see this uh, path go inside this and uh, this is completely related to the java coding application okay so here 
where it is Okay, inside the resources directory means there is a separate directory called resources. There we have some properties files. If you see for every application, there will be a properties file. So what is this properties file? If I open this application or properties file, you see this is a key value pair. Understood, right? So when this application is going to start, this Java application is going to start, it will take these values from this properties file and it will start the application. If you see this application dot properties file, so some values has been set. So based upon this, that application will run. Okay. And if you see here, spring dot data source dot schema. So the path is this has been set. Okay. And logging information. Compulsory if the Java application will be there. This kind of whenever in case you got opportunity to work on uh, creating Kubernetes cluster, deploying the application then you need to uh, if you are working with java application then definitely for that java microservice for every microservice it is going to have one properties file compulsory if if you are working with the java application so the functionality how it should work if you see here logging information by default this is enabled means info means what application whenever you go and check in the log file of application it will give you the only info not the errors warnings it will give so if you give debug means it will give more information but as of now this is commented so these kind of properties will be like uh, values will be set inside the properties file so based on this that application will work okay and uh, if you go back one step you can see another properties file also here application hyphen mysql dot properties file so here what it is defined database related means this application is need to connect to the database okay so what is the database type and uh, database url to connect the database and uh, username to connect the database and password to connect the database right mean this website is expecting a database and the database should able to connect so when we deploy this application actually this along with the application it will create database pod also so that automatically it will collect we don't need to do anything so because everything in the database uh, related configuration everything they have configured inside this chart so we don't need to do everything that we'll discuss later so here main important is basically this properties values also will be in the same file itself in real time most of the time means they don't need to be separate separate files database information also you can configure here itself okay so assume below this line we have configured database related stuff like this is a database server and uh, this is a database username password and the port host name or your ip address will be defined so that this application whenever it is starting it will go and connect to the database if the database is not available then this the uh, application will not come online properly because it should connect to the database compulsory because it is mentioned here that uh, it should connect then only if you see here if it is not connected then the, it will not function properly your application will not function properly because it should fetch the information from the database only right so whenever this this code will be where this is a source code means developers are writing here if you go to the main so this is complete this uh, application are uh, dealing with the developers place. this is not belongs to as a devops engineers because this is an application code we are not we can give only permission in github or bitbucket to whom we should give access for this repository but we are not dealing how who is managing this how what are the changes code level changes are doing that is responsibility of the developers so it's their uh, stuff our devops engineer stuff will be something else like we have a uh, we are working with ansible we are creating ansible playbooks okay that 
we are the owner for the ansible playbooks we create terraform scripts so we put uh, one repository and we'll put all the terraform scripts over there our arm templates or any shell scripting python scripting which we are dealing with devops guys we are the owner for that and th this repository owners will be developers they are changing the code they will go here and they'll write the code here okay so if you see this all these files it's their responsibility to write all this file the code level changes right so we are not the responsible they will connect to this repository and clone it and they will do the changes again they will push it and the application properties also it's their responsibility to uh, manage it so now uh, whenever so this is basically confirm we can finish it in five minutes but how exactly it will be used in the real time i'm explaining you from the scratch okay so that when you get opportunity so easily you can able to uh, work with confirmation because it's very very important so this is uh, source code it can be bitbucket it can be svn or it can be github anything okay source code management and the developers will clone the code and they will do the check-in and whenever they push the code if it is configured with uh, webhooks then immediately jenkins will pick up the jenkins will pick up the code and it will build okay it will create an artifact if you remember the maven okay so what it will do so jenkins will pick up and uh, it will create mvn clean deploy or mvn uh, create package it will create an artifact so if it is a web then it will be create a var and that var will go and store inside the artifactory so here this artifactory will store this either this can be nexus or jfrog or any cloud related uh, artifacts like acr or ecr or gcr these are cloud related artifacts it can be anything on premises means you can use these things and uh, what it will create with this var it can create an image also docker image means in the ci job itself already shown you the ci job example ci job the uh, stages will be there in the pipeline so first it will clone the code and then it will create an artifact and that var file with the help of var file it will create an docker image this will be in the ci job and this image will go and store inside the repository right and after that in the cd job we are going to deploy so we will deploy this image inside the kubernetes cluster okay so now assume this is one of the microservice we are deploying and uh, it is getting deployed on this particular part and this name is assume the name of this microservice application microservices uh, give some name okay abc this microservice name is and uh, one more microservice also is in a separate uh, github repository the code and that is also get deployed here and uh, this is the name of this another microservice okay so here one microservice sometimes just now we have seen the application is trying to connect database same way here also this microservice or application wants to connect the database and then also this want to connect to this one also like we discussed in the services class cluster ip purpose is what internal cluster communication means one service want to communicate with the other service okay so then we create cluster ip means this microservice no need to access from the external world then we can create cluster ip for this one so that if internally any other microservice or application trying to connect to this 
um, microservice then we should create a cluster ip service so that the name of that cluster ip we will provide to the service okay microservice which is trying to connect the name service discovery name so automatically it will pick up the ip address of that service so that we can do so where you are going to give that information you are going to give inside the properties file so in the same properties file here which i've shown you in the same properties file we are going to give the name okay that the service name is there equal to that's name so that it will go and connect to that service like how it's trying to connect the database same way it will try to connect to the service so that information also we will give in the properties file okay previously assume there is no kubernetes concept that application want to connect so what they used to give they will give assume this is in the virtual machine assume this is one virtual machine this is one virtual machine and uh, we'll give this virtual machine ip inside the properties file okay so means whatever the name it want to connect that name we will give equal to this ip so whenever this micro this application is trying to connect to this application it will take this virtual machine ip but here it's a pods concept okay kubernetes cluster concept so what we can give we cannot give the pod name so we need to give the service which we are creating for this microservice and that service name we are providing here inside this service properties file so that this service can able to connect whether this service is externally accessing then we'll use load balancer as a service and what are the name you define it that name will give here if this is not required to access from the external world then we'll create cluster ip concept and that name of that cluster ip service will give it here okay so this is how we'll connect internally so that information also will give inside the application dot properties file itself okay and one more scenario is database whether your database is inside the cluster or maybe your database is externally configured maybe it's in a pass service okay in aws if it is an rds in a azure you have an external database service that is a scenario or maybe it is on your on premises based upon that database ip port number username password that will be also available okay good now assume uh, this is a uh, cluster ip service i configured for this uh, microservice cluster ip name is um, my service okay this is the name so this name has been defined inside the application dot properties here wherever the code is there the source code for that microservice is there in the application dot properties cde equal to uh, my service this is the service name we are giving so when it got deployed it will whenever it is coming online it will check for the internal cluster my service if it is there then it will connect to this application assume i changed uh, this service name means next time when i am creating the service for this uh, microservice i changed it to something else okay so something like 01 then next time when you restart this uh, microservice it will try to connect my service cluster ip but it will not be available then what it will do it will not connect because it did not find the name then how we are going to change it for this application you will inform to the developers that uh, the service name has been changed so that they will um, change the cd equal to here my01 so that whenever they do the changes immediately with the help of webbooks docker ci job will execute because code level changes whenever the code check in happens it will execute the ci job it will create new var and it will create a docker image and ci will be completed and with this latest image again you need to deploy the application 
the same application then this contains properties contains my service 01 so that it can go and connect to this application same way to the database also if the database is having uh, my database the database name or maybe the password username is so username equal to abc and uh, password was one two three four five six but password has been changed so this information you need to update in the properties file and again your part should be restarted so that means whenever you change in the application or properties file again the new image should be created because in the image it will contain the latest properties file which has been modified and then that image you need to deploy so whenever if there is any changes in the application or properties file always you are keep on modifying it you are creating a new wire file but it is not necessary right why because they are not changing in the application coding level if the application coding level is changing then we need there might be new changes so that's why we are creating a new var and then with that we are creating image but there is no need they are not doing any application code level modifications they are doing only properties they are doing so in the kubernetes we have a concept called config maps okay so what is this config maps to whatever this application dot properties file is there this will be inside the application only we'll copy all these properties from this file to in the kubernetes we have an object called config maps we'll put all this content inside this config maps and this config map we will give at the time of deployment let's say in the you are creating a type called a deployment.yaml or maybe pod.yaml file to create a pod so inside that spec field we are going to give config maps and we'll give the name of this config map what are the config map you are going to create so this config map contains the complete information means whatever this file contains all this information will be in the config maps so when this for, for the first time in the pod is getting created we'll give this config maps also and uh, as i said all these properties will be available here inside this one so at the runtime of this application it will take all the key value paste from this config maps and uh, it will start okay in future as i said if some passwords has been changed you no need to modify here okay you can modify in the config maps and again you retry you restart or redeploy the pod here only if you execute cd job here then it will take the values from the config maps understood so config maps also containing the same so why we are giving here because if assume hundreds of uh, values key value pairs are inside the key value pair inside your, your application or properties file so all those key value pairs if you are mentioning here in future if you want to change any of the key value then you no need to go again here modify here see a job new docker image not required in the config map we change the value okay when we change the key value pair and again we redeploy that pod then at the runtime it will take it will expect the config maps okay so it will it is expecting to take the value from this config maps so it will take the new value from this config map and it will apply to that pod okay so that's why we create config maps so what is telling here uh, in the caution where it is so don't use if the data you want to store are confidential use a secret means in the properties file i am mentioning it should connect the database also so database username password is confidential so we cannot give blindly 
uh, username password inside the config maps for that we should use secrets okay secrets and config maps both are almost same only thing is config map will be in the plain text format and uh, secrets will be in the encoded format not encrypted encoded format that is the only difference okay so in the config maps directly if someone opens that config map it will, will be clearly seen username equal to this one and password equal to this one okay in the uh, plain clear text format it will be available apart from credentials any keys okay remaining all the key value pairs you can use inside this config maps so this is about the config mess which is very very important if you are deploying any application so we will definitely create a config maps and this will be provided by the developers so because this application or properties will be provided by the developers with the help of this we will create config maps and all this will be available inside this key values will be available here so whenever you want to change any suppose i was showing you um, that um, log right log is showing as an info suppose application is not functioning properly you application guys want to troubleshoot then how they will troubleshoot by checking the logs so logs is coming only info so they want to see in depth then they ask us to debug okay mention the in remove info and put it as a debug so to do this what we need to do we need to comment this and we need to enable this feature so this property you enable so if you're doing this again you no need to create a ca job create a new docker image so unnecessary creating multiple docker images because when the docker image when the var should create if there is any changes in the code level okay then the new image is going to be necessary but here nothing is changing from the code level so here in the config maps we can do modification remove info and then mention debug and then again we'll execute cd job so that while deploying it will take the config maps and it will take the latest value whatever we define inside the config maps so if you don't mention config maps then application will get deployed whatever is inside that file okay means whenever it's creating image whatever the file values was there it will take by default those values if you are giving config maps means it is overwriting those values and it is applying these values to your pod that is the purpose of config map so here you are not creating unnecessary docker images and sometimes you see it will take a lot of time ci job means in real time it will take a lot of time to complete that ci job uh, because a lot of test cases will be there everything should run a lot of time will take but and that is waste and uh, creating multiple docker images is also waste so the same image we can use only the properties we are going to change with the contracts this is how we use in the real time scenarios okay so we can create this config maps in t, uh, three different ways directories files literal values in this three ways we can create this config map so if you see here configure So if you see here config map QC will create config map and um, the name of your config map and source Okay, so here if you see create config maps from directories so from directories Means if you just know we have seen for this pet clinic It's showing two properties files, right? So if you have more than one properties file then you can create a directory and inside that you can mention the values, okay the files of your properties files 
and uh, with the directory you can create so both the properties files will be created as a single config map if you have more than one it can be two three four properties files are there all together you can put it in a one directory and with the help of the directory we can create config maps here it is showing one example so it's getting downloaded um, two config maps from the kubernetes sites itself one is game dot properties and ui dot properties two files we can download locally into one directory and that directory name we can use while creating this config map you see this is a directory name it is getting created directory and this is subdirectory and uh, we are downloading these two files inside the directory and then create config map this is the config map name and then iphone iphone from iphone file okay this is a key we are giving and this is a directory so whatever files are available inside this directory with the help of that it will create a config map okay so the output is similar to this so you can check the describe command of this config map so we can see the data this is a game dot properties see values these are the values and this is ui dot properties values these two files values will be there okay so this is another method create config maps from files means single file is there only if you have single file then you can use kubectl create config map game iphone config this is the name we are giving and iphone iphone from file equal to this is a path and this is a single file name we are giving so the single file also we can able to create config maps okay and uh, where is the literal so when i was building when i was deploying the application i was the only person who is handling uh, this kubernetes so at that time uh, i was creating the config maps for the applications the microservices so sometimes see this is very very important iphone iphone from iphone env iphone file and uh, iphone iphone from iphone file initially i was using this option config maps getting created but application couldn't able to take the config map values okay so then i was using this iphone iphone from iphone env iphone file how that properties file has been designed based on that you need to check when you deploy the application you need to test it whether it is taking the config maps values or internal values only because your application also contains one properties file which is available by default in the code but you are giving some values from the outside with in the config maps okay so that you need to confirm whether it is applying or not suppose here the name is my service 01 and in this main application or properties file it is having my service only so when this application is getting started in the logs you can see whether it's trying to connect my service 01 or my service if it is connecting to my service but in the config maps you mentioned my service 01 which means it is not taking the value of your my service so for the first time you need to know how your properties file is there based on that which one is suitable this is iphone uh, env environment variable way is it configured or normal properties it is configured that will be decided okay only two options are there iphone iphone from iphone file or iphone iphone from iphone env iphone file these are the two different types so you can test it by creating your config maps in both the ways how it is working you will come to know okay so now we'll see uh, we'll create this config maps i don't have any application for you to show that testing okay um, yes we can create that application uh, config maps for that let me power on the aws i think it's already powered on
I hope you guys are understanding, right? Yeah, Shivraj, tell me. What is the question? Shivraj, are you there? I think he pasted his question in the chat. Okay, let me check that. Uh, where does the config file reside? Where does config map file means which file? I think just we are talking about the config files, right? If it is one or two. Are they going to be in a folder or? See, as I said, microservices contains their application dot properties file in the reach microservice repository. And this application dot properties file will take it as an administrators, Kubernetes administrators, will have in our anywhere, okay, wherever. We want to execute the kubectl command so in that location locally you should have that right now i'm executing from the master server so it should be available in the master suppose if it is an uh, gke or uh, aks then you are executing command from your local laptop right kubectl command then it should be in your local those files should be so that whenever you are creating kubectl create command config map then you are giving the path hyphen hyphen from hyphen file uh, equal to the path you are giving so where is that path so if it is in your local then you should give that local path right now i'm executing it from the uh, master server so it should be inside the master server if you're executing from your local laptop that kubectl command then it should be inside your local machine Okay, so we'll ask them, we'll ask developers to give those files so that if you have 10 microservices, 10 microservices is having uh, properties file for each and every microservice, then we'll take all those 10 and we'll create 10 config maps for each microservice and we'll name it with that application microservice name. There will be compulsory, there will be microservice name will be there. So with that, we'll name it. Okay. So here, So first what we'll do, we'll create a directory. So as per this documentation, create the local directory or else if you are, how you are accessing your cluster, it depends. If you don't have master, if it is not a bare metal, uh, if it is an, uh, as I said, GKE, AKS, then you are going to send kubectl command from your, if it is an AKS, then you are going to use PowerShell or maybe CMD to connect your AKS cluster. If it is an uh, GKE, then you might be using CMD. Okay, so from here you might be using kubectl command. So locally you'll install kubectl, and as I said, we'll copy that config file into your local, and from here we will send the API request like kubectl get nodes, get pods, whatever you're typing, it will connect to the cluster. We use information. So at that time. In your present working directory you should have the all the properties file so that you can use kubectl create uh, config maps and then iphone iphone from iphone file then equal to the present working directory location whatever is there wherever you are in your laptop you store those files that location you need to give to create the config map okay 
so now i'm in the master and uh, so as per their recommendation i'm creating a directory and then through duplicate we are going to download to files so already this directory was created okay so I should go inside the directory and then I need to execute this wget command so that it will download in the present working directory. Okay, no need because already here it is mentioned uh, the path. So it will go and download there. Okay. So we no need to go inside the directory dot mandator because here I for no output should be stored inside this specific path. So I'm downloading the second one. So now I'll go inside that path and we'll see two files has been downloaded okay so now with the help of this we can create a config map you can see here kubectl create config map and this is a name for config map we are giving iphone hyphen iphone from iphone file and uh, equal to this is a directory so these are creating from the directory okay so let me copy this so whatever the files you have inside that it will apply to all those files So this is a relative path. It's already exists. So what I'm going to do, I will give the name iPhone zero one. Okay. So config map has been created. If you want to see kubectl get cm, it's shortcut for config maps. You can see. This is the one the snow got created. Okay. Config map has been created. So always remember when we discussed about namespace, when you create config maps, I did not give any namespace. So by default, it got created in the default namespace. So when you are deploying the application, your config map is in the default namespace and your pod is getting created in different namespace but in the pod specification if you give this config map it cannot access okay it cannot take from this one it will give you error config map not found or it will take by default uh, internal uh, properties file and it will come on like or else it will not start when we are for example when you are deploying the application through helm chart at that time it will not get deployed it will get failed because it will set config map not for so always remember config maps or secrets all should be in the same namespace when you're deploying the application pod in a different namespace and you are trying to use the config map of another namespace it will not work resources should belongs to the same namespace all okay then it will work so right now this is in the default uh, namespace and uh, if you see with the describe command so with the describe command kubectl describe cm so if you see this is the data which is inside this this way okay this is the ui properties and this is game dot properties values so this might be using for some application if you see color dot good equal to purple color dot bad equal to yellow okay so 
this properties might be using for some application to run so that application will use this properties and based on that it will function so create config maps from files so create config map from files is nothing but let's say same directory instead of two files assume we have only one file then we can give that file name directly basically in real time most of the times we'll use this one if in case we have only single properties file for your application no need to give the directory only simple is previously we are giving till here directory so whatever the files was there inside directory all got applied but now if it is a single file then give that file name here that's it it will get created now the same command i'll execute but i need to change the name okay here give some other name let's say 02 got created if ctl get cm and this is the one kubectl describe cm so it's showing only game dot properties values it is only showing okay this is based upon the files like we are talking about here directories files literal values so from directories how to create from files how to create and uh, now we'll see literal values so where is it literal values and one important thing is when you are talking about helm charts at that time see initially when you are building the cluster you will create this manually right but once you start creating the cluster building everything we expect everything should be automated you are doing this manual stuff manually i'm creating this config map but when the application is getting deployed i want this should be created along with the deployment itself i don't want to create it manually right now i'm creating manually the config map and then i'll deploy the application means i'll execute the pod or deployment.yaml file to deploy the application right but in real time the your cd job should do that not you are doing manually creating so config map should be created so in the helm chart we will provide the config map file okay so how to convert that with the help of this command you are going to get a yaml file like how your deployment.yaml file is available the same way your config map will also will be converted into that it's very simple by using this uh, where is that command this one kubectl get config map your config map uh, name iphone oyaml then it will be shown in this way okay so this you can copy and you can put it in the helm chart so when the deployment job is happening at that time it will use this file and it will create the config map okay so as of now when you describe it is showing in this way there is no like uh, if you look into the deployment.yml file pod.yml file there is an api version kind specs all these things are right so if you want in that manner then kubectl get cm get means it's an information just output i want in the yaml file that's it so if you see here api version data kind config map so this way so this you can we can copy and again i'll show you when we talk about uh, helm charts there we will define this config map detail because in helm chart you are going to define everything while deploying if the volume should be created if the config map should be created 
any objects if you are trying to create to run that microservice all those components will be in the helm chart helm chart is combination of multiple objects or resources to create all together those files will be in a single chart that's it okay so there we will give this yaml file in this manner so that at the time of deploying sequentially it will going to create whatever the necessary things is required to run that application on a pod if the volume should be created if the config map should be created if secret should be created if any other resources should be created whatever is defined in that helm chart everything gets created and application will run automatically that is all we need to do in the real time everything should be automated manually we will not go and create each and every object right so that's how it will help any object you can get it in this way if i know yaml means it will show you in the yaml format okay so config map this way it will help you and uh, literal values that is literal this literal values is you are not going to give any file any directories you are giving key value pair in the command itself okay here if you see literal special dot how equal to very and special dot type equal to charm and this is the key and this is a value this is the key this is a value basically in the previous topic we have a file inside that file we have a key value pairs these are these are basically these are key this is the value right so we have a file inside that file key value pair contents but in the literal there will be no file in the command itself you are giving what is the key what is the value okay this way also you can give it okay so you need to do practice and then only you can able to understand all these things and need to read the complete documentation when you do practice then only you can able to understand it okay so when you use this config map so it will take this special dot how very special dot type charm so these two values it is going to take it okay these are just an example the real example i shown you here okay in the pet clinic website how this will be there so uh, we don't do any modification so, uh, yeah so we can give any number of values in the literal section i mean key value yes key value pair yes multiple key okay. value pairs you can give in the literal values so then what is the best way the first one or the second one see mostly it will be iphone iphone um, as i said here from as i said files if multiple files are there for properties then you should use directories means very simple that is you are not specifying any specific file name you are just giving the directory name if you have only single file name then you should give the file value see creating from directories means what if you have more than one file as an properties file then you use this one okay create config map the directory name which contains the files if you don't have multiple files only single file then give this directory name and the file name what are that single file is that that's it from iphone file mostly we don't use literal values 95 percent use this concept only if you have multiple files then give the directory name if you have single file then give the file name while creating config maps okay so only thing is in the config maps you should not define uh credentials okay some in my i will tell you my organization setup like where i am working there we are giving the credentials in the config map why because what are the credentials we are using we are using already some other tool to encrypt those credentials and that 
value we are providing inside the config maps so even if someone looks into it also they are not going to access to the application because it is uh, encrypted with the tool and uh, when the application is getting started there it will in the application itself it will be decrypted so we don't need to worry about that so that's why we are using the credentials inside the config map only okay but if you don't have any other mechanism in such way in your organization then you should use the secret concept so like in ansible vault you have secret okay you are going to store the credentials right same way you're also you can use secret means when you are creating credentials it will be encoded okay that way you need to provide credentials in the secrets we'll discuss about secret later on so this is about the config maps actually it will we can finish it in five to ten minutes this config maps but it's very important to know how really we use this config map in the organizations is very very important so if you have any doubts you can ask me or else we'll wind up for today's session so tomorrow we'll come up with some new topics like uh, node selectors uh, init containers what is init containers some other small small topics all together we'll finish in tomorrow's session Hey, Praveen, I, I need to do last uh, three or four classes. I was busy otherwise, but basically does uh, the AWS uh, servers, if you create it one for the uh, one for a couple of nodes and one cluster, is that enough or do I need to have an account in uh, a GCP as well and work uh, with these exercises? See, if you use GCP, then mm -hmm. it will be good because you are getting free, right? Free yeah. account. And 20,000 they are crediting in AWS. At least you need to use one uh, T2 dot medium instance for your master. Mm -hmm. So without so having anything, in I suggest okay. Without having anything in uh, AWS, I can just work in the GCP, right? For all these exercises. Yes. Okay. Uh, Praveen, okay. I have a question. Yeah. It's, it's 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 related to the Docker. Hmm. Uh, so uh, how do we you know like uh, uh, do a Docker scanning? Okay, let's say I have created a Docker image. Okay, hmm. so how do I do a security check of that? Of that so whether uh, each la each layer is working fine or not. Every layer. Hmm. I mean, how do I? because uh, when i create that uh, a docker image so it is in a package now which includes mm. other dependencies uh, dependencies okay so how do i you know like uh, uh, check to see whether you know like there are any uh, vulnerabilities for that particular packages or dependencies so that will be docker i think docker clear because actually uh, i mean uh, this was uh, a question from a client so this so we were not doing docker bench okay okay so docker bench for security script that checks for dozens of common best practice around deploying docker containers in production so you can go with this one docker bench you can go through this and you can uh, use this one so this will scan or parse every layer of the docker image yeah you can go through this i never went through okay. this okay documentation so what it hmm. will do scanning how it will do everything they'll mention some scenarios so you can check whether it will fulfill your requirement okay okay i'll do that okay and one more question simple question so in ci cd hmm. okay in cd so d stands for hmm. delivery or deployment deployment see when what we are talking here is it's a deployment so ci cd and another cd will be there two cds will be there okay, okay. one cd is for deployment another cd is for delivery so what i mean how, how it is anyway what is the difference basically that you will come in the devops classes right so you complete already devops no, I was just asking, Pravin. 
no i am also just asking like you because here some guys are coming from devops batch okay so it's mixed of devops guys and uh, kubernetes batch so i'm just checking whether you are from the devops batch or uh, no, 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 directly no, 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 from the kubernetes batch directly kubernetes okay you did you do the kubernetes uh, devops previously yeah 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 okay so this will be cleared over there itself right what is the different cds deployment and delivery when i just read on my own i had this doubt okay so the delivery continuous deployment means whenever the application you want to deploy into the environment whether it's a virtual machine or maybe cluster whatever it may be the deployment will be there and uh, delivery means the final whatever we are delivering okay means all together whether the applications are running fine or not so we are use, giving it to the end users to access it after deploying the application that is called as a delivery so today we will talk about uh, the concept called helm okay so this is not in uh, kubernetes object but uh, it's out of kubernetes but this is very very important topic we need to know in real time to deploy the applications on kubernetes cluster so does anyone have idea about uh, what is helm no okay so here uh, Praveen, one thing uh, yeah will you be covering secrets yeah that we will discuss tomorrow secret Fine, uh, okay in it, the small topics we'll discuss tomorrow okay <clears throat> so here assume we have a, a cluster whether it may be on-premises or whether it may be manager service if the managed service is there then we don't see any master server and if it is a kubedm concert bare metal or cops then we see master server so whenever we are deploying an application assume your project which your project you are working so that project might having let's say some 15 microservices basically uh, we'll have a lot of microservices because your big component of your application will be divided into small small uh, applications as a microservice so on an average if you're taking 15 microservices for an example so each microservice we are going to deploy so in github or bitbucket for each microservice the application code will be in each different repository in the source code management so developers will clone that repository and they'll do modification to that specific repository and uh, that repository that application is going to be created as an var file and uh, that will be converted into the docker image and the docker image is going to be deployed into the cluster okay that is what we will do in the real time so now whenever each microservice need to be deployed it may be expecting a lot of components kubernetes components should be created okay so to deploy the application we use deployment uh, dot yaml file we already discussed about uh, different types of deployments a stateful set uh, replica set and deployment daemon set but mostly 90 percent for our application we use the kind is deployment because in the deployment we have different facilities like uh, rolling update blue green deployment uh, canary deployment okay different options to upgrade your applications for specific kind of reason only we use daemon set we already discussed the daemon set means your pod will go and create in each and every work not compulsory that will do it for only any log aggregation elk or prometheus for those only we use daemon set so 95 percent for our applications we use deployment uh, kind only so that will be we can name anything so mostly it will be deployment.yaml file 
so here not only this deployment.yaml file we may need some other resources to run these applications as i said yesterday it may need config map config map for having the properties or it may also contain secret also to store the credentials remaining all the fields might be available inside the config map but credentials we can store create inside the secret and uh, we'll use another uh, object called image cool secret tomorrow also just uh, remind me about this i'll explain about image cool secret so the concept of image cool secret is we are defining in the deployment.yaml file about the image to pull from artifactory so this cluster need to have access to the repository then only it can pull the image so for that purpose we'll create image pull secret with credentials of artifactory like uh, in the docker when we are practicing how we uh, used docker login and then we provided the docker of credentials then only from the docker machine i can able to connect to the docker hub same way cluster should able to access the artifactory so this is an artifactory so from this artifactory cluster should connect and it should pull the images so for that we'll create image pull secret tomorrow i'll show you it's very it's a single command we can create image pull secret here so this is the one we will create so lot of other components like for example auto scaling you want to do obviously for production environment we want to configure auto scaling our pod means initially we might create with for high availability see fault tolerance and high availability is very much important so for high availability we'll mention three three replicas inside the deployment.yaml file so three will be get created but in future due to heavy load on those three then what is going to happen it should auto scale instead of three it should extend to four five so we want to auto scale for that we have a concept called hpa we need another configuration file okay so horizontal pod auto scaler we call it as an. so for this one we will configure and the service whether cluster ip or whether it's a node port or whether it's a load balancer how we can access this specific pod whether this specific uh, microservice need to be accessed from the external world or maybe internally based on that will configure service so it will be uh, load balancer or uh, anything depends upon the requirement so like this multiple objects of kubernetes are required to run a single microservice so the same thing mostly we'll use it for remaining microservice also right so this it may require for another microservice for every 15 micro for every microservice we might need this one depends mostly these are common okay image pull secret is common to pull the image of the specific microservice all the 15 microservice images will be here so to pull that it will use this one and every microservice need horizontal pod auto scaler and uh, every service need a uh, every microservice need a service to access apart from that it depends on this applications it may expect some other components also okay given this having lot of components it might expect some other component so how you are going to create all these things so manually we are going to create right so as of now whatever we practice first of all if it is a deployment then what you are going to do you are going to use kubectl create uh, the yaml file create if and f uh, and the deployment.yaml file same way we are going to create all components manually okay so in real time we don't do this way we use helm charts okay so what is this helm 
helm is a package manager for only kubernetes okay so if you go to helm.sh website this is a website name so there itself we can see the headlines the package manager for kubernetes so helm is the best way to find share and use software built for kubernetes specifically this is for the kubernetes as a package manager so helm helps you manage kubernetes applications so helm charts help you define install and upgrade even the most complex kubernetes applications so here lot of advantages on this helm so today the complete session will be what is the purpose of helm how we can create it and how we can deploy what are the advantages all these things we'll discuss so if we take an example let's say in the linux i hope most of you guys are aware about linux operating system in linux uh, rhl5 before rhl5 rhtl rhl4 how we used to install the packages does anyone have idea anyone from the linux background to install a software package in the linux operating system before rhl5 so how we used to install rpm yes so we are using rpm command to install a package any software package if it is a linux machine and uh, if i want to install any package then i need to manually download that package inside this machine and uh, i need to execute rpm hyphen ivh and the package name but due to lot of dependency issues because this package will expect some other package rpm package should be available inside this machine then it will fail it will fail stating that due to dependency of this package it cannot able to install then again manually we need to download that specific package and uh, place it in this machine and then first i install that specific package and then again we'll come back to this package but when i'm trying to install the second package again it might also fail by expecting some other dependency so like this it may go up to 5 10 15 also sometimes the, the dependency issue so there was a lot of headache for the administrators during that time then rhl introduced a concept called yum yellow dog update manager so yum introduced so what yum will do it's a package manager for rhl same way we can see uh, apt get for uh, debian and ubuntu and if you see python is also having their own package manager called uh, uh, pip and for windows we have a package manager called chocolatey so these are the package managers so what yum will do so yum whenever so we are going to have a configuration file inside this etc yum dot repos dot d inside that we'll have one configuration file some abc dot repo so inside this file we'll define one url where everything will be available all the packages let's say if you have a red hat operating system red hat related repositories will be available inside this location by default when you install the operating system so when i type yum install some package name http package name then it will connect to this repository in this repo the urls will be there the central repositories so it will connect to the repository and from there it will download the package so if the packages are not available here then you cannot able to install the package mostly os related softwares you are going to get it here so if you want to install jenkins with yum command you will not get in the default repository of the operating system so jenkins is providing some separate repository then you need to configure that repository inside your this location m.repos.d then whenever you install yum install jenkins it will connect to this one and it will install so this is easy for administrator right same way here also 
this is an package manager okay so you can create a helm chart and that helm chart you can store in the some central location helm repos and from there you can able to deploy your applications so here what we are going to do we will create helm charts helm create give any name your microservice name or application name chart will be created configure it and then make it as a package and that package we can store it in the some remote repository okay so in the cloud also we have a concept called acr gcr right the repositories so there not only the docker images we can even store the helm charts also so the chart will be zipped it's like a tar file and that tar file will be stored inside the we call it as an helm repo okay we can store it there because whenever we are doing modification to the chart it will changing the version so it's like in git how it is maintaining the version control same way here the <coughs> helm repo will also maintain the versions of your chart so whenever you want to deploy specific version of chart on kubernetes cluster then we can use specific version of chart okay so that is how um, we configure so first let me power on my machines uh, so that we can uh, create it So now we talk about uh, architecture helm architecture now how it will be the helm architecture so this will be the client and this is the server side component so helm will be installed on any of the client machine so this client machine can be your local laptop or it can be any virtual machine any linux virtual machine also it can be or it can be your local laptop also client so here we will install helm software we will get helm software in different ways for mac also we'll get for windows for linux all the flavors we'll get helm client package we'll install here and a server side component there will be a component called tiller basically helm is having two versions okay helm 2 and 3 so as of now we are discussing two after discussing everything practical maybe later on i'll explain you about three the difference is three for three there is a no component of tiller component on the cluster side means kubernetes cluster side so first we'll discuss two because not sure in your organization whether still they are using two or three 
so let's discuss both two and three okay so the architecture will be we need one helm software helm software should be installed in some location so as i said this can be your laptop or macbook or maybe any virtual machine and the tiller component will be inside your cluster so whenever you install any package from here we can execute helm command so helm install the package name then it will go and install this package inside this cluster so whenever we are executing this it will go and talk to this tiller and tiller will do your deployment whatever you are trying to deploy the application the tiller will take care and from this component server side component it will deploy the applications but how come this client machines knows that we have a cluster and it should go and communicate to this tiller so to do that like how we are able to execute kubectl command from my local machine or maybe from other machine we need to copy the if you remember etc uh, kubernetes admin.conf file so if you remember this file to execute the kubectl commands we copied this file to our local machine so that we can able to access the cluster wherever from wherever you want to access the cluster then you should copy this admin.conf file into this local so let's say this is one linux machine so log into any user account whether it may be root or any normal user account inside that okay home so here we'll create dot cube directory and we'll copy this admin.conf file as a config file over here from this user account this helm can able to execute okay so use the same user account to initialize this helm also it means when you install that helm package assume this is some normal user account in the same user account also you are going to install this package so then this helm is going to talk to this cluster that is how it will talk to the cluster and whenever you execute this helm install package name it will go and talk to the cluster and it will deploy the applications so helm is having lot of commands so you can use helm uh, upgrade and the package name because if you modify anything inside your helm chart then again you can use helm upgrade so that what are the changes you have done in the helm chart that will be upgraded okay so i created a document for this how to configure in real time this client machine will be your jenkins server okay so we create a jenkins server inside this jenkins server will configure this will install this helm package and uh, will install we copy this config file inside this jenkins server why because whenever i trigger cd job my jenkins server should deploy the application on the cluster that we'll discuss in the coming sessions when we trying to deploy the real time application on the cluster at that time i will show you how we will deploy the applications with the helm chart okay so for that purpose what i'm going to do i'm going to create one jenkins server and inside the jenkins server i'm going to install helm package and i'm going to copy this config file from this cluster so that i can use this machine as a client machine okay or else no need of jenkins just as of now for today's session you can take any linux machine from there also you can able to do that okay later on we'll configure jenkins instead of wasting time to configure java jenkins software all the prerequisites because anyhow we are not going to um, build anything so that's why i'm going to take one linux machine which will be in the same network so that they can able to communicate okay always remember they should be in the same network it should be able to communicate okay 
so lot of comments are there we'll discuss one by one of helm command each and every command how to configure that so now as of now what i'm going to do i'm going to take one more linux machine to install uh, helm hmm, which one would be better let me take this one So it is coming online and uh, GitHub. Uh, this is a uh, this. I hope you guys have. I might use two um, GitHub accounts. Okay, so one is init six tech and uh, another one is this one. So you can uh, use this one. So repositories docs. If you see helm tiller configuration installing helm on jenkins server basically it can be any server as of today so we use this document for in future classes okay when we try to deploy the application through jenkins means whenever i trigger cd job how the applications will go and deploy in the kubernetes cluster for that at the time we'll use jenkins as of now um, we use any normal Linux machine. Okay, so this is a command. First, we'll download this from the internet and we'll give permission and then we'll execute this one, the version. And uh, from the cluster side, <coughs> we should be able to create this service account, <coughs> cluster role binding. These are some components. We have separate session for this. We call this RBAC role based access control. So the tiller means what is this? RBAC means what? We are giving a user to authorize on cluster to access the cluster completely, like permissions. For example, the difference between root user and normal user, normal user doesn't have full permissions, but we can give permissions by adding into the sodas file or by giving some specific commands also right we can give some specific commands to uh, execute something which normal user cannot do instead of giving full access same way in the cluster also we'll create an account and we can give access on cluster what kind of uh, objects we can give access for example i can create a user account and i can give access to specific namespace so that user can only access the resources of specific namespace or i will give access to see only deployments apart from that the user cannot able to see some other deployment like uh, services horizontal pod auto scalers config maps this he cannot able to see that user so that way we can create so here also we are creating a tiller user and for that user we are creating a roles okay service account cluster role binding because here tiller is taking care of deployment so it should have the authority to access the permission to cluster so that's why we are creating these two steps okay and then copying the cube file and then we are executing this one helm init hyphen hyphen service hyphen account tiller okay this command we need to execute these are the few commands so if already Jenkins is installed, then these steps we need to follow if you already installed. So to have Jenkins, what you need? You need to have Java 1.8 and uh, another thing is install Jenkins. So I'll do one thing, I'll install Jenkins and uh, I'll install Java and then I'll follow this process. Okay. But a lot of other things also required. If you see in the in future classes, for future classes, we need many things. Uh, Jenkins server setup. If you see, uh, Maven, Git, Docker, all these things are required. 
but as of now for helm tiller configuration you need not require jenkins also you take any user account in that user account you just uh, download this and from the cluster side create this components and uh, in that user copy this q file and execute this okay so i'm not going to install any jenkins as of now instead of confusion so now let me log into this linux machine hmm So I'm going to take this machine so as a root itself. I'm going to use I'm executing these commands so What I can do here So this one from internet I'm downloading this it's Downloaded this is a script and uh, changing the permissions See, uh, for you, whenever you want to install, you can use Helm website also to download the packages. There you will get multiple options in different machines how to install. Install Helm. So here in the documentation also you will get it. If it is Mac. this way also you can use it desired version you can download and tar extract it and move that uh, command to us local bin so that you can able to execute and uh, this is what i am doing right now curl command change mode and uh, here if you see extra option i have giving this one why because sometimes in real time you need to go with specific version otherwise maybe the if you do this one if you execute this command it will execute it install the latest version of helm so sometimes the latest version might not work properly with your kubernetes cluster so which version of kubernetes cluster you are using based on that you need to check the compatible version of helm so i always prefer two steps okay two versions older okay from the current version so that's why i am using here specific 2.14.1 okay so that way you need to check okay otherwise it will install the latest one and uh, this is for uh, mac brio install helm it will install and this is chocolatey for windows choco install kubernetes 7 helm it will install and this is for Debian and Ubuntu and PIP will also available I think so okay so now what I'm going to do I will execute this one it's installed now if you type helm the package is, the command is available okay so this is completed now in the cluster side you need to configure this one okay so i already executed this commands because this is an old cluster so we can already able to see that
so cube ctl get service account grab python hiller okay it will be inside the cube iphone and cube iphone system namespace so tiller account was already created 45 days ago so if you want we can delete all these components i can we can create it cluster role binding and a cluster role and a cluster admin we can delete all these things and we can again recreate so i'm not going to delete it just you need to execute blindly these two commands so one is creating service account another is creating these uh, roles and that roles are binding with this service account so the tiller is going to have full authority on the cluster because it needs to deploy applications so whatever the resources you are defining inside the helm chart everything it should be created so that's why it should have full access like how we give sudo access same way here also for tiller we are giving full authority okay so you can execute these two commands in your cluster and now we are copying this config file inside this linux machines whatever the linux machine i have right now this one here i'm going to copy it so here cat etc so this is the file and uh, before that we need to create a directory called a cube Let me create a directory or it was available and uh, let me go inside this dot cube so nothing found i need to copy this content vi config and inside this paste if you want to execute kubectl commands from here then you need to install kubectl package also over here so that you can able to execute kubectl commands from here also kubectl get pods nodes everything you can do it from here if you have kubectl i think it should be there yes kubectl is there so kubectl get pods iphone n and um, cube iphone system it's showing the pods from this linux machine so this kubectl can be executed from anywhere only two things you require you need to install kubectl package and the admin.con file should be copied it can be any virtual machine it can be your local machine anywhere you can do this kubectl command you can able to execute no need to be always to connect to the cluster master so here it has been copied now in this machine so i need to execute one command this command so when I execute this command what it will do it will go and do one deployment if you see here cube hmm, ctl get pods iphone n cube iphone system can you see the tiller deploy so whenever we execute this command helm in it so this is going to be created kubectl get deployment hyphen n cube hyphen system so what this command is doing whenever we execute this command it is creating a deployment in the cluster connecting to the cluster and deploying and it's creating one pod so this pod will take care of all the deployments whenever you do it from the uh, helm from here so here tiller pod is going to take care of deploying the applications so whenever you do any in deployments from here it will go to the tiller component 
that pod will take care of deploying the applications inside this cluster if any problem with this tiller pod then you cannot deploy the applications to the cluster so always it should be up and running okay so now i am in this linux machine so uh, i am going to create uh, yep yeah will it create a service also mm -hmm. will it create service service as well when we... what service i mean ip the ip i mean it doesn't change i did not get you which service you are talking about and what you are asking uh, means will it create means uh, who who will create helm helm tiller when, yeah i mean this helm complete uh, structure will it create that service hmm. service in the sense uh, the ip which doesn't change even if the pod dies hmm and when the new pod gets created for which pod you are talking for tiller pod or any application pod uh i mean uh, the worker node the pods are which are created here from this worker node side so that not tiller i mean the application pod i'm asking okay so can you please come again if the application pods are get created so what you are expecting to create by help Hello. I mean, even in case if the even if in case if the pods die, okay. Uh, so mm. uh, new pod in a will be created. It is taking care of a Kubernetes, okay. And uh, the IP yeah. will not change because we have configured service here, right? We have configured the service. Yes. IP won't change. So I'm asking, mm. will this Helm also help in creating that service also? You mean to say cluster IP or load balancer or node port service is it going to create? Are you asking this? Yeah, just a service, not a cluster. You know, I'm asking just service. Yeah, in the previous mm -hmm. session when I talked about service, service means what? It can be cluster IP, load balancer, or node port. It depends yeah, upon that microservice which service it required, whether cluster IP to internally communicate or it need to be communicate through the external then it need load balancer this need to be configured so as i said helm can create anything any object of kubernetes it can be created so only thing what we are doing we are placing that particular yaml file inside the chart so as i said here uh, here if you see this is a service so any object you are putting that file inside the chart so this all together is calling as a chart here so service.yml file is nothing but it's an service only it's up to you what you configure there whether it's a load balancer node port or a cluster ip whatever the service you configure for this service so it will be configured all together is combined is called as a chart so any object okay, you want to create so put all those things for that whatever the dependencies is having one microservice to run what are the components it's required so we are going to have all those components related stuff as an yaml file so every yaml file will be inside this chart okay so when you execute this chart all together will go and created and when you delete this chart all together will be deleted all the components okay okay understood let's say you want to create namespace first in that namespace you want to deploy the applications so that namespace related yaml file also you can define here and it will create namespace and inside that this objects are going to be created okay okay so when i type helm repo list it is saying i did not initialize it so i need to initialize so what i'm going to do hmm, i'll execute this final command
we'll see where yes it's done pillar is already installed in the cluster okay so let me see whether so it's saying already tiller component is already there so that's why it is uh, not creating so otherwise it will create the component so now if i type helm repo list if you see helm repo list it is showing the stable repository so by default how the Red Hat operating system guys are providing one default repository. Let's say, for example, right now I'm using cat etc. Uh, this is Amazon Linux image. So when I create Amazon Linux instance by default, if you see um, in the etc m dot repos here, we can see these repositories by default. Some repositories are available. So here, whenever I'm typing any package of operating system to install, it will connect to this repositories and it will try to download. If I go with this main dot repo, so these are the URLs. It will go and connect to this and it will try to pull that software and it will download here. Same way when I configure Helm here, Helm repo list, it is showing by default repository. Kubernetes hyphen charts means Kubernetes is giving you a lot of default helm charts. So those helm charts you can able to use to deploy your applications, not applications, your microservices, but your, for example, um, EFK is there, Elastic Search Flow in Kibana. You want to configure this. How we are going to do that? Manually you need to write a yaml file for everything like deployment type replicas where is the image of that elastic search and how much cpu you want to allocate how much ram all these things you need to write it but no need you are going to get lot of default helm charts predefined helm charts which you can use blindly in your organization okay but not for your microservices for your microservices you are going to write your helm chart customized helm chart but there are some stable helm charts are available which is providing by the kubernetes and from there you can get but for example rabbit mq you want to configure messaging queue and uh, mysql or uh, jenkins and uh, prometheus grafana for all this you have a default helm charts are available that is called name is called stable so let me take you to that helm charts now hmm. prometheus helm chart if you see a stable prometheus in the github you are going to get all these helm charts so if i go here you see here helm charts tree master stable so this is what it will connect if i search helm search prometheus like yum search command this is also um, helm search prometheus so it is connecting to this table means this one this this one and it is showing in prometheus we have different types of uh, requirements are there but if you want to configure prometheus we use this one prometheus is a monitoring system and time series database okay this is our chart which is required helm search jenkins it is connecting the default repository only single helm chart is there and the chart version and the latest open source contains integration server so here if you see i think this will be taking a lengthy session tomorrow also i think uh, we need to continue with this helm because uh, half of the concept is completed as of now so if you see here this is how helm chart looks like and uh, if you see the templates directory here you can see all these uh, different types of directories again it looks like very lengthy um, huge uh, repository 
so instead of that to easily understand we'll go for efk templates so not only the stable version sometimes we may use some other third party some other guy for example even i'm good at uh, some topics so blind sometimes blindly we cannot use the helm charts which are providing the stable we need to do a little bit of modification so sometimes what i'll do i'll do those modification and i'll put that helm chart in my public repository so if you guys want you can able to also download like that so many other people will modify that helm chart and they will place in their public repository those things will also will be available here so like this guy is providing uh, efk okay so what i'll do i'll go one step back here and later prometheus so we can able to see all these helm charts artifactory and um, the no names are um, elastic stack elastic search curator this is elastic search okay if you see here uh, elastic search these are the files means these mean i was telling you right these are the components so here for elastic search these many components are getting created deployment ingress controller service account config map not sure what is this pdb service account it's getting created and one stateful set also it's getting deployed even in kubernetes we have a concept called job so these many components are getting created role binding role so like i was showing you here cluster role cluster role binding this also we can define inside a helm charts so that will also get created so all this components are getting created okay so tomorrow what we'll do where i will create an helm chart and we need to know the directory structure so as of now what i'll do these are the helm charts which are some application purpose like prometheus grafana elastic search mysql jenkins okay fluentd see the grafana is there some other applications heapster is a metric server so in this purpose we'll use this predefined helm charts which are providing by the kubernetes this is also some important influx db where is jenkins so jenkins so if you go to the jenkins here predefined helm charts what are the requirements will be there everything they are providing we can use it see for jenkins these many components are getting created secrets master slave configuration so this is master okay if the volume is required then uh, it will create volumes also network ingress controller all this has been configured so everything we gets created but we for our applications we need to create our own helm charts because you know what is required for your microservice these are some predefined uh, based upon the jenkins uh, they are configured whatever is required but for our microservices application microservices we are going to configure our own helm charts how it will be so the first for example for the first microservice i am going to create helm chart then what i am going to do uh, in which directory you want to create let's say mk directory uh, my chart so cd my charts helm create your microservice name you can give uh, a b c d okay this is the chart name got created one directory created if you go inside the directory directory structure will be there 
so if you this is the structure okay directory structure so we need to understand this directory structure okay so what i'll do tomorrow i'll explain this directory structure and uh, i will show you from sitting here how to install application on the kubernetes cluster we'll discuss so for as of now you don't create any jenkins server okay don't install anything only thing you need to do is three steps this one okay first step and uh, execute these two commands on the cluster and then this is also not required i'll do one thing this is the step and because later on we'll discuss about uh, jenkins no we don't need to waste time to because we are not using jenkins in this today session or maybe tomorrow and this you need to do for any of the user whether it's a root or a so this can be either root or any home user it's up to you If it is a root, then no, not required to change any permissions. Okay, and then execute this command. These are the four steps you need to do. Okay. So this way you need to do you can see lot of latest versions also if you want to try with latest version you can try 2.16 2.17 is also there so you can try with latest version also so when you execute this command successfully it should able to connect to the cluster see this should not get any error when you execute this command successfully it should connect to the cluster and uh, it should able to create tiller deployment here 